very good morning to all of you and i once again welcome you all to the live webinar with professor chintamani a world renowned surgeon and an exceptional and a very passionate teacher so uh, before we begin i want to know if you can all uh, hear us and so yes after the tremendous success of the previous webinar uh, a lot of you wrote on the uh, in the group uh, regarding various uh, uh, queries of common scenarios in the ward and therefore then sir decided that this webinar will be dedicated to the various uh, ward run scenarios and their management so uh, i request you all uh, to welcome uh, professor chintamani sir so very good morning to you good morning and it's a privilege for all of us to have you here sir pleasure is mine thank you very much to the good morning to all of you uh now i have a little request uh one that uh, ward rounds cannot be uh, taught like uh, the didactic talk it has to be interactive which would mean that at any given point of time if i am asking you some questions please answer them i'll modify and if you don't volunteer it may not be easy because then i'll have to ask uh, supriti to uh, answer a few questions because ward rounds are essentially a two way traffic it cannot be just me talking about it right so um, once again a good very good morning my morning to all of you and this is what you all requested for so i, I we tried to put them all together we compiled the cases in such a way like we discussed during our uh, annual meeting or when we do the scope course or when we do the gurukul course so we'll start with it you're very excited for the class same here very very excited to share with you all it's a, such a joy thank you all very much so let's start and uh, we will have some what scenarios where i'll i'll uh, ask supriti to read the case and then we'll go any time i'm repeating because we we'll need to have uh, some bit of interaction i'm repeating it i will leave some questions in between and we will like, wait for you to raise your hands or maybe may, we'll unmute one of you at one time and you can answer the question so that we make it into an interactive uh, uh interactive kind of a session and let's see how it goes and i'm sure it will go very well and we are all going to have a good time so let's start uh, the the next the first case is that of a 26 years gentleman that is presented to surgical emergency can you read out the yes, uh, features so uh, it's a 26 years gentleman who presented to the surgical emergency with features of perforation peritonitis The patient had an Apache II score of 13 and was taken up for emergency surgery. Right. So there are a few things here which I would like to highlight. When you get to, get to present a ward round, so some of you who are preparing for the DNB exam would be getting it as a major part of their exam because it's a major contribution to your scores. But for the others who are doing MS or who are going for fellowships at the Royal Colleges or other places or Going for the exams at local site, or, or for practice in general, it is going to be important to know as to how do you present your case. Now, what did she mention here, and what is written? Age of the patient becomes important. It's not enough to say I have a case of perforation peritonitis, but so that would be a very, very suboptimal way of presenting. The patient had it's a case of features of perforation peritonitis, but the important thing is the score, Apache II score. What does that do? It automatically tells me how good is the patient's general condition. Apache two, uh, Apache stands for acute physiology and chronic health evaluation. It has some number of variables. How many are there? Thirteen. Thirteen variables, and the score is also thirteen. Can you just rattle out a few of them? Sir, so it includes the GCS. Then there are some clinical uh, features: the age of the patient, and uh, then the uh, sex of the patient. Then uh, about the mean arterial the vitals the blood pressure mean arterial pressure the respiratory rate the temperature and uh, some of the clinic uh, the so the you have chronic points patients. and acute points the chronic points are age as you mentioned and also the um, overall patient's nutritional status although that doesn't get counted directly then you have acute features it also includes glasgow coma scale so please read that because <coughs> <coughs> sorry when we put up the webinar on the youtube you'll get to see the scale but what is important here is to understand that don't just mention a 
a case of a 26 year gentleman with perforation peritonitis that won't be enough it is actually um, with the score you must tell me and then we can plan our treatment accordingly and i generally would ask anybody who's presenting me the ward rounds why what is the significance of the score and your answer should be the score is to let us know how was the patient's condition before we took her up or took him up for anything definitive so that's important and uh, the the next important thing is to make sure that the duration is indicated which is just not mentioned here but will be described so there are a few points missing which i'll keep filling up so perforation peritonitis is for how long does so that duration would make a difference now uh, so what did, what did i mention here the important thing one is you mentioned that it is suspected why based on the clinical features so what would be the clinical features patient may give you history of some preceding illness like in case of enteric fever may give you history of maybe tuberculosis in some cases may not give it all the time but may give that's why i'm saying may give patient may give you a history of trauma <laughs> Patient will give you a history of ingestion of steroids, NSAIDs, etc. I'm not going there. So history, a good history is important. In addition to the history, what becomes important is your examination. And when you're examining, you would find an abdomen which is tender, guarded. and usually silent the patient can also give you a history that there were features suggestive of, patient may have features suggestive of obstruction beforehand <coughs> which subsequently led to uh, a silent abdomen so a very very loud abdomen becoming a silent abdomen would also suggest perforation peritonitis so we must be taking a history to reach a doubtful uh, scenario then you would, of course, purpose for liver dullness. Remember, every examiner, and especially the senior ones, are very happy when you mention this feature because this is a clinical sign of perforation peritonitis. And you should then be able to demonstrate as to how do you purpose for it. Now, whenever you're purposing it, whenever you're purposing the abdomen, we know that. I think I've covered it. There are some videos of mine. If you're interested, you can go. Start from the second intercostal space by getting to the angle of Louis and then percus slightly away from the mid cleft line. You start from mid cleft line, but you don't go vertically down because if you go vertically down, the problem would be that you will uh, hit into, uh, say, if you go vertically down like this, these are the zones where there are bones only. So you won't be able to, the cartilage is only that. You won't get a very good. Assessment. So it starts in the mid clavicle line and kind of moves towards the anti axillary line. It should be done, and you should mention even if you you've done it, it's fine, but must mention. So clinically you suspect it, and you think it to be perfusion peritonitis. Now score means you will investigate. Based you can't do scoring of pache unless you investigate. We follow it as a routine protocol, and actually we manage them based on the score which is not mandatory, although we have our own publication on this. And a lot of you have mentioned, uh, having read it, a lot of you got back on the group, which I really, I mean, I'm take, going to take that into consideration. A question was asked, which I'll cover here. Would that Apache to scoring based uh, perforation and peritonitis management uh, be all right for the diurnal ulcer perforations also, the other perforations also? The answer is no so far. We haven't documented it. We haven't published it. But it can be used as a rough guideline. Because Apache doesn't talk about a perforation peritonitis, it talks about the status of the patient. And it is not enough to say, I found that the patient was not looking good. That is not the answer. Not looking good, you should be able to let us know how bad was the patient. And that would mean scoring. Therefore, score some way. You can use any score. A lot of people have used P POSUM. But it's not a very good score for planning the therapy. Apache 2 is also not a great score for planning therapy, but we used it. And we used it in ileal perforations and we brought down the mortality from 40 percent to four percent and we also found out where to do what it helped and i was we were looking for a basically a resident proof protocol so that the resident doesn't have to think much 
otherwise each resident would have his, his own conception concept about how bad the abdomen is so briefly that is what i thought i'll discuss with you now the interoperative findings to the so the interoperative finding um it was a single small one into one centimeter enteric perforation which was 50 centimeter from ileocecal junction rest of the bowel was healthy and the question that is being asked is what next uh, i request nana to unmute herself you are self muted right now yes oh so uh, sir, I'd uh, like to go as the, um, uh, the sir, for, uh, uh, Apache score is 13. I'd like to go for an uh, ileostomy and uh, also um, uh, for the ilo. First, yeah, I'll... first of all, first of all, Nana, you're suggesting you'll go for surgery. Would you like to investigate this patient or you won't? Sir, intraop uh, intra decision. No, first, I'd like to... a... no, no, no. I just I want to extrapolate it for the benefit of others. You would have investigated, then you would have gone in for surgery, and now that you've decided to, uh, we are dealing with the um, perforation which we have given you already. I understand that we are giving you an interoperative finding. So, yes, sir. what investigation hindsight you would have done to uh, to reach to this point? So, before the before um, surgery, yes, yes, I'd like yes, to go for an uh, erect abdominal X-ray and. Uh, Except abdomen erect, very good. And chest X-ray, uh, chest X-ray, the that is the standard for a perforation. Yes. And, and what all investigation you would do for the Apache score that we've given you? So the lactate, I'll go for an ABG testing. Lactate, I'll uh, test, and the vitals will give me the values. And of course, the electrolytes. Wonderful, brilliant. So you answered it. And we'll carry, we'll stick with you. Now, uh, so you decided to go for ileostomy. Any reasons why? Sir, as the Apache score is between 11 to 20, the patient is uh, not fit for a primary uh, closure. So I'd like to go for a um, uh, ileostomy. And uh, also um, uh, with ileocecal valve, I'd like to... Um, uh, uh, That's wonderful. You like to make it incompetent. Incompetent. What do you do? Incompetent, Nana? So just with the two fingers, I can roll the valve between my fingers and... Uh, See, we, we, where did we mention was the site of perforation? 50 centimeter. Towards the terminal part. So yes, you can do... One is you can break it between the thumb and the index finger. And if it was closer to the ileocecal junction, then you could push in a... Through the stoma, you can push in a Foley's catheter, inflate the balloon and pull it. So that can also help you do it. That's, that's, I think that would please any examiner that you're not going to simply say, I look at the amount of sepsis, which you of course would look. And uh, I think that that is more or less answered as I would want it. Uh, in this case, we are not going to do a primary closure because the score is uh, more than 11, more than 10. Usually what Tana is talking about is our publication on this. If the score was 21, Nana, what would you have done? So then I would uh, not have gone for surgery and I would have uh, improved the vitals of the patient, put in a drain and uh, then waited for a patch to be uh, less than 20 and then go for surgery. Excellent, excellent, brilliant. That's wonderful. You would use the word optimize. Yes, sir. Then you provide, you will put a flank drain. You're absolutely correct and that will decompress partly and you'll use the up, uh, optimum support of the of the surgical ic if you can and then bring the score to 20 so that you come back to group two and then you manage it as group two i think that was a wonderful discussion on this now when you're doing an ileostomy nana uh, this before you do that you've got the perforation uh, sort of isolated what do you do to the peritoneal contamination um, sir, I'll um, wash the abdomen with uh, yes, warm saline. Peritoneal lavage with what? Sorry, yes, you are right. So with warm uh, normal saline, 0.9 percent normal saline. Excellent. Yes, that's brilliant. Rather than uh, what? What is the role of adding metrogel or betadine to saline? Would that help more? 
no so that will lead to more adhesions uh, which is the most common cause of obstruction post op uh, and uh, and does it help anyway it will not because it has been found if i if i do a, a very very thorough lavage of the peritoneal cavity how much saline do you think we would generally require your copy book so, so at least 3 liters 3 to 4 liters yeah i'm glad you took the middle path is a book say about 10 liters which would mean that all your hospital would go without saline so three liters is the maximum why do we why do you want to use the warm saline why not use simple saline oh sir if there's any component of the intestine uh, with the um, the blood supply can improve with the warm okay saline. anything else so that's all i can think of what's what's a major uh, major, uh, what is the major problem with most sick patients? Yes. The hypothermia. Yes, hypothermia, and the yes. core temperature can actually drop, which is a killer. What does hypothermia leads to? Uh, uh, the production of more of anaerobic meta uh, 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 metabolism, which lead to more lactic acid, and it's not good. A lukewarm saline, while hot saline can damage the gut. You're very right. Any other disadvantage of betadine for a wash? So, no, so I cannot think of. Okay. It is epitheliocidal. That's very good. It is uh, likely to damage all the epithelium, and that is uh, why it's not a very good agent for even wounds anymore, because it will destroy the epithelial cells and granulation tissue or healing. No advantage of using betadine, and there is no evidence to support. Use that statement as an answer. There is no evidence to support the advantage with any of these agents. Yes, sir. And what one is to it will keep the abdomen warm, which is a core temperature will stay because that's a core temperature. It's very, very important. And secondly, it will um, provide you the adequate washing. But if you if I do with 12 liters or 13 liters, then what can be a disadvantage? I'm sure others are also listening, so they're also gaining from it. You answered beautifully so far. Uh, we'll we'll try the multiple answers in the next round because we are we want to be carrying on as long as the net is working fine. Now, any disadvantage of a very very thorough lavage, too thorough for comfort. What can be the disadvantage? You keep cavity. What can what is it that you're going to lose? So the important uh, nutrients and the the electrolyte imbalance. Uh, okay. The opsonins. Opsonins, which are protective. Yes. So yes. wash away what is the natural defense. But that's well done. Uh, thank you. We'll unmute you. Uh, we'll mute you again, thank right? And you yes. particip two participating. Yes. Uh, so uh, we'll move on to what was done in this case. And we got one scenario. Now this is what was done. Uh, primary repair of the perforation and loop ileostomy, which was proximal, was done. You could have done just the ileostomy also. But since the distal part could not be delivered by the registrar, so this was the question I would ask. Why didn't you exteriorize? Is there any role of exteriorizing the perforation? There is a role. And uh, we'll discuss it quickly. I'll show it to you. Sorry, I'm sorry. Now, if I have a perforation here, I have an option to repair it, bring this out as a loop ileostomy. I also have an option to bring this out as loop ileostomy. Because usually in entry perforation, you have the segment of gut which is not healthy. So it is better to make sure that you're not leaving some un invisible perforations. It is said that for each one that you see, it's 10 that you miss. So a lot of these patients come back with another leak sometime later. So proximal ileostomy can be a good option in that case because it will keep the segment without pressure. Now there is also a role of understanding. I think I can take anybody else if he's willing about planning your ileostomy and uh, the significance of perforation being 
closer to the Alicicle Junction versus far away from the Alicicle Junction. Anybody would like to take it? Anybody can uh, raise uh, his or her hand? Push, can you hear me? Please unmute yourself. Uh, good afternoon, yeah, sir. Yeah, unmuted. Good afternoon. Yeah, now how would it matter, Push, if I'm close to the ICJ or away from the ICJ? taking this decision. Can you answer that quickly, please? So if it is uh, closer to the ileocecal junction, yes, it is a high pressure zone. If the ileocecal junction is not functioning then, in yes. that situation. High pressure zone next. So uh, second thing is uh, uh, the contents of the uh, ileostomy. OK. It is more close. If it is more closer towards the IVC, uh, ileocecal junction, I'll have a longer length of bowel available for absorption of the nutrients and stuff. Okay, that's a common sense answer. Very good. What else? And uh, so, second thing is the uh, adapt adaptation, sir. Uh, if well, that's later. Right now, regarding your decision, what Nana said, we'll do ileostomy, and uh, the perforation. Is here versus perforation is here are different scenarios. Okay, I'll cover it up. You answered it very nicely. One is it's a high pressure zone. I agree, right? And um, yes. the second is second is now only one person would speak. So let me speak right now. Let me also. <laughs> it may not be possible to bring it out because it's relatively fixed, right? But the important aspect is, I mean, most, most perforations close to the ileocecal junction have this issue. The blood supply is not so good. Ileocecal branch of the supemesentric artery divides like this, and you know that. One part goes to the ileum, the other part goes to the cecum. And this is the one which gives branch to the appendicular. This is the appendicular branch. Now this area, it's usually with limited blood supply. That is why you people are often asked in right hemicolectomy, why do we remove the terminal ileum 10, 15 centimeters? And the reason is this, because this arc is, it's not the arc of Rayalon. This arc is likely to give a window of chemia. So if there is a perforation here, it has different features vis-a-vis -vis perforation proximally in terms of management. That's what I was asking. So this would be a practical question which will be asked. Now, so you can hear, you can close the perforation and bring the proximal loop out, which is also a possibility. All right. What else is peculiar to the terminal ileum push? Push, unmute yourself. Uh, mute. Yeah. So uh, one what thing else? is it is a rich lymphoid tissue in the terminal ileum. Excellent rich lymphatic tissue which therefore predisposes to some specific diseases including tuberculosis now how is a tuberculosis ulcer perforation different from the classical enteric or typhoid perforation please so uh, the typhoid perforation hmm. It is uh, longitudinal, longitudinally uh, located, uh, longitudinally long, and the uh, uh, tubercular perforation that transfers. Okay. See that this is your teaching of uh, pathology, which is, I mean, you must have seen a perforation. It cannot be made out whether it's longitudinal or transverse. This is yes. a pathology. So main the tuberculosis, so I, I, uh, it is submucosally sub infected and typhoid enters through the mucosa within. That's one point where I will give you 10 out of 10, but not for this. 10 out of 10 for that. Most of the tubercular uh, uh, nodules are submucosal. Therefore, when you do colonoscopy in the colon, you won't get tuberculosis easily in a colonoscopic biopsy. Because you only get mucosa there. But now listen to it carefully. The tubercular ulcers are classically ischemic ulcers. 
and that means they will have endarthritis which will make them fibrotic because ischemia leads to more fibrosis now therefore they rarely perforate and none of them is transverse or longitudinal yes typhoid perforations can extend beyond their boundaries the other thing is tuberculosis ulcers if they perforate we are dealing with even a suppressed immunity because otherwise fibrosis will prevent it from happening the other thing is tubercular ulcers also don't bleed because there is screening so what the, <laughs> when they perforate or when they bleed we are usually looking at an immunosuppressed individual now tubercular ulcers will have an abdominal presentation totally different from the type of perforation we, we are now muting yourself you answered it beautifully now uh, we'll call you back for participation as we move on so this is how the two would differ and the management of the perforation closer to the aristocle junction versus away from the aristocle junction would vary in this tubercular ulcers are more fibrotic so rarely perforate typhoid ulcers are not fibrotic they start from mucosa down so they are weak and uh, they are actually in the pears patches we know that these are basically in the terminal ileum more commonly seen but remember most perforations of the ileum are in the terminal part for various reasons and the pears patches are they make the bowel fragile and weak and there is also an element of what is been taught to you in pathology zenker's degeneration in typhoid which is why typhoid ulcers perforate typhoid patients have burst abdomen typhoid patients have weak abdominal walls it's all related to zenker's Zenker degeneration but tubercular ulcers are totally different and then patient may give you history of tuberculosis and of course the appearance of the peritoneal cavity can be they can be a dry or wet type of tuberculosis so that's about this case can we move to the next yes, part now so we did this and um, <coughs> You may be asked as to this will be presented by somebody. So in this case, it will be presenting for all of you to. Then when you start answering, and mind you, this is an exam all over in Europe, in US, wherever the ward rounds. I'm trying to club all of them together. It's not just the DNV kind of ward rounds, which are covered primarily. But these questions would be asked, and the answers would be as you people have done. Both Nana and Kush have done brilliantly well. So as far as I'm concerned, in their ward rounds, they have scored the marks they needed. And they can add to their score subsequently. Now with that, the first case is done. We move to the next case. Uh, Sukriti, can you read it? Yes. Sir. Okay. This is the the patient's condition, and patient um, is lying comfortably. So post of day five, patient is accepting orally, and the ileostomy is functioning well. The wound is healthy, but the patient is having fever spike of 102 degree Fahrenheit with tachypnea and tachycardia. The total leukocyte count is also raised. And on ultrasound, it reveals moderate collection in the right subphrenic space. What next? Who's going to take it quickly? Yeah, so, great. What next? So the patient has features of local hypermetrics. There is a collection in the right subphrenic space. So how would you proceed? So, the moderate collection with patient is stable. Then we can do for a conservative management. Okay, you use your voice is not very clear, but I understood what you're trying to say in Newton. One is remember pus somewhere. Pus nowhere. You know, your audio was not very good. <laughs> Therefore, I had to uh, quickly get out of this this discussion. But pus somewhere, pus nowhere, pus under the diaphragm. This is a standard teaching. Now, patient has features of fever. There is leukocytosis. Your next step would be this only. We'll try and find out where is the pus, and uh, we can go back to maybe Kush. And we will ask him as to how do we proceed because he was involved initially. 
Yes, sir. Yes. Now, this is what was found, and unfortunately, Shinivas couldn't be heard well. There is pus there, pus nowhere, pus under the diaphragm, and there is a collection under the right dome. That's what it shows. So, how do you proceed now? Patient is running fever. So, it is post operative day five with an intra abdominal collection. So, it classifies as organ space surgical site infection. Excellent answer organ space surgical site infection. What is the approach to this? OSSSI. So, uh, first, I would like to uh, know the culture and sensitivity of the pus collection and the quantity. Yes, unless you ask. I would like to do a unique added aspiration of the collection and send it for culture sensitivity. Excellent answer. Image guided always. We will do ultrasound guided aspiration. We send it for culture sensitivity. Yes. So if it can be dry tapped in the same setting, I would like to completely dry tap the collection. Great. You'll do the dry tapping. And if you've done the dry tap, what next thing you would do? So I would like to see the color of the the consistency, the color and the properties of the pus which I have obtained. Consistency you can't see. Consistency is a palpatory finding. But yes, color and appearance, right? Yes, sir. How would that help you? <coughs> so, uh, it will uh, give me an idea of the uh, uh, possible organisms and the uh, source of the infection. How? Uh, elaborate, please. So, if it is uh, feculent, it could be from the bowel or bilious. It could be from the a secondary perforation or a Intra. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, you are clear. Yeah. Carry on. So, if it is feculent, it can be from an hydrogenic injury which was created during the previous exploration. But wouldn't that patient present totally differently? Yes, sir. Or it could be, sir, due to uh, an undrained pocket of collection. After giving washes, there would be a residual collection. And if yes, it was not. That's much better. When you are talking about OSSSI. Usually it's a undrained or not lavaged, unlavaged part, which is perfectly all right. So what would you do? You've done the dry tap. And so start the patient on empirical antibiotics if he's not on any antibiotics initially post-operatively and uh, accordingly change to the culture sensitivity obtained. I think you answered it mostly. Suppose the collection was also in the pelvis. What features would the patient have in addition to what you got under the diaphragm? So he would have a suprapubic pain. All right. Diarrhea. Pelvic diarrhea. Now, once yes. you get the pelvic diarrhea, how do you proceed? Which one examination you'll do and which one investigation? You've done ultrasound already. You know, upper rectal examination. Work? Yes, the term for rectal now is uh, questions DRE, you know, digital rectal examination in which position? So, an uh, lithotomy. Very good, lithotomy position rather than the standard SIMS position, right? Because you want it to project deeper, I mean, you want to be able to feel it. Now, what can you do in these cases? Suppose it is thick. And your tap is not working, and the collection is only in the pelvis. What are the options? So, a per rectal drainage can be done. So, again, per rectal drainage under ultrasound guidance can be a very good method, and you can leave a drain there. It is possible to leave a drain there, reaching it to just the rectal mucosa, and with an absorbable suture, and you can remove it later on. It is a very good method of draining it, actually. If you look at the screen, that's the position of this being a male patient. That's the lateral section of the pelvis. This is the spine, that's the rectum. And the retorial reflection is like this pouch. This is the cycle pouch. Patient of the non milliers, perineal body. How we are, aren't we? And the collection is somewhere here. Root. 
and actually drain it this way and it can be completely extraperitoneal drainage which can serve very well and patient may not need anything to be done to the abdomen and as you rightly mentioned you, uh, well answered Kush I enjoyed it the the subphrenic abscess also can be drained and we can move uh, to antibiotics based on the culture sensitivity you should be able to answer questions as the examiner is talking to you and the questions will keep coming out as you are answering properly you mentioned about organ space surgical site infection and you should read about it this is a type of an ssi only but it is pod5 it is related to that and very correctly answered now uh, the other important aspect is you can drain it using image guided approach through DRE, which is through the rectal approach, or you can do it through the, uh, through the uh, uh, subsequent. Any, any role of uh, diagnostic laparoscopy and drainage if it is needed? Yes, there is a role, but not in minor collection. So I think we'll I'm, move on. Okay. Please. Do you want to come? Yeah, please unmute. Kush or Dr. Kush? No, 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 no. Okay. okay so yeah, hello. Kush, yeah, you can mute yourself now. We will we'll just run through all the questions that I asked and the questions that can be asked in your exam. So just pay attention right now. Uh, you all answered very well. I'm starting and then all of you. So you'll be asked about these are the questions which I'm repeating here. Management of post-operative intra-abdominal collection or abscess you should know when does perforation occur in enteric perforation usually the third week types of ileostomy they'll be asked here we'll discuss it again complications of ileostomy can be discussed here then what is the high output versus the low output endocutaneous fish line may not be relevant directly and antibiotic usage in enteric fever and perforation now what antibiotics are used and most of the questions we have answered Maybe anybody can finally take one question so that everybody participates. You can go back to Srinivas who are probably not able to answer properly. What are the types of ileostomies? You'll be asked. Can you tell us quickly? Yes, sir, um, there is an and ileostomy, um, double barrel ileostomy, loop ileostomy, permanent and temporary. Okay, your audio is still not too good, but I understood you said one is double barrel. What is double barrel ileostomy? Sir, uh, can you put the both distal and proximal uh, ends of the ileum through the same opening? Hello? Are so I'll ready? make it easier for you. Yes, yes. So they can be basically a temporary and a permanent ileostomy. This is also a method of dividing. I'm muting everybody. Temporary and permanent. Permanent is done, say, in conditions like when you've done proctose sigmoidocolectomy for ulcerative colitis, then you make pouches and you do the cox ileostomy, etc. That's permanent. And it'll be invariably the end ileostomy. That's the end of it. Temporary ileostomies are of various types. And let's not make a rocket science out of it, which is what happened. See, the loop is here i have just made an opening now if i bring it out it look like two openings because there are two openings here. the rest of the loop is intact now that's a simple loop ileostomy and just because two loops are visible that does not become double barrel don't use that word more because rarely is it done now. Double barrel is related to the gun that you see with double barrels, where there is one nozzle, there's space in between, then the other nozzle. If I have space in between, like a spur of skin, and the two loops separately, that is double barrel.
Then there are types of contented ileostomies where instead of getting the loop out directly, we take it out in a zigzag fashion. One layer through one muscle, then here at different levels, it is going through different layers of muscle. <coughs> so it becomes sort of a continent. lost me and uh, of them one of one type is cox there are many types so don't get into that it's rarely used you would not be bothered by this too frequently nobody will ask you these questions but i thought since we are talking might as well you can see that the content has to go zigzag and it is a muscle splitting stoma but the disadvantage is very obvious whatever is continent can get obstructed also. So the major problem is obstruction. So that's it. Now the other scenario is you cannot bring the two loops close to each other and you have one end loop and at some distance you have mucous fistula which is a distal part. And this is not Hartman's. Hartman's is only confined to sigmoid and rectum. Don't misuse that term. Hartman's is exclusively for sigmoid rectum. So this would be the ileostomy and this would be the mucus fistula. If the two are brought up through the same wound, but with a spur in between, this is double balance. I hope I've made it clear. So. This is the precisely the definition. You can ask me later on if there's a doubt. Next case, please. Um, it's a case of appendicular perforation with two existing <coughs> solitary liver abscess who underwent exploratory laparotomy three days back. Appendectomy was done along with drainage of the abscess, peritoneal lavage, and a drain was placed in Morrison's pouch. The patient is afebrile, accepting orally, passing stools, but is draining around 150 ml of bilious fluid from the drain per day. Now, uh, case of appendicular perforation, and there was also a solitary liver abscess. For this, exploratory laparotomy was done, so we will not get into that confusion. And during this exploration, appendicectomy could be done and the abscess could be drained. Peritoneal lavage was done and a drain was placed in Morrison's pouch or the hepatorenal pouch of Morrison, one of the dependent areas, the most dependent area in his point position. We're not in the position which you see the patient. Now you can see the content. They are all real cases, no imaginary case. You are the kind of cases you, they are all from my ward. The patient is afebrile. There's absolutely no problem taking orally, passing stools, but is draining around 150 ml of bilious fluid from the drain per day what do we do next who's going to take that question quickly please volunteer so that we can move on and all of you are good so don't bother about ask your questions hello hello yes sir yes sir. good afternoon yeah. sir. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, sir, there may be uh, during the drainage of the liver absence there may be uh, binary communication from the liver so I would like to go for a HIDA scan. What scan? HIDA. HIDA scan. HIDA. This is a patient in the emergency with, uh, yeah. that's why I asked you this question. There are things you do which are simpler. Uh, HIDA yeah. scan is something you do at the drop of a hat. It's not always possible, right? So what do yeah, you yeah. do? You're a post-graduate in a unit. You don't do HIDA scan as the first investigation. How much is the bile coming? One ml what is the possibility you said communication i won't call it communication but i'll call it it's a bilary canicular which is injured right yeah, or it was yeah, a part yes, of it. it's draining 150 ml and you must read the patient not the just the story third day yeah. pod3 patient is fine a febrile passing to taking orally is there any so other then option that I you have or just the HIDA scan? 
sir i will wait wait for uh, the drainage to come uh, uh, low i don't hear you i'm sorry that problem can you speak softly and away from the mic yeah hello yeah i can hear you carry on yeah sir i will wait for the drainage to uh, come low if the patient's condition is yeah yeah the page that what you should say correct now patient's condition is important no patient is doing fine and yeah. it is is it unusual to find these because the water rounds are about the uh, can if you can see the picture water rounds are about what common scenarios you face right so here yeah, you yes, can sir. see with my uh, it is draining right now all right but uh, it is yeah. expected to stop it is expected to reduce, yeah. reduce initially yeah. i am not saying that you would not do yeah. eda scan at all in any cases suppose you done a eda scan how will it change your huh. management so uh, it will uh, help will uh, help to confirm that there is a definite leak or uh, uh, from which part it is you leaking but it will okay you found, yeah you found out there is a leak the scan is not so specific for which canal killers you are coming from but yes, it will show you the yeah. leak fine next what do you think? but sir it will not uh, uh, help in the uh, definitive management in this case only yes good point now therefore now you are get, getting back to it therefore yeah. all that is necessary to be done we should not talk about very high investigations Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what I understand you are saying is, Ken. Yes. Sir. The patient is out, and it's just about 50 ml, and it's only third day. It is possible that it may reduce over a period of time. Yes. Then sir. I can ask. Suppose after 10 days also, it is not reducing. Mm -hmm. In fact, increasing. Yeah. What is that you can do? Then you talk about EDA scan. What is EDA scan? Yeah. What is he does, sir? It is uh, uh, sir, immunodiagnostic acid uh, scintigraphy. <laughs> Now you got. I would not have asked you about he does scan if you had not yeah. mentioned it. So remember in the exam, answer things yeah. which are simple so that you can handle them. Yes, sir. Get my point. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so, thank you, sir. Do not buy your questions unnecessarily. Got it? So yeah. we will yes, simply addition, and yeah. if the country, if the, if the amount is reducing, we should not be too yeah. bothered. Gradually. You know the principle of uh, surgery, the principle of life. Yeah. If normal passage is clear. The abnormal passage yeah. close. So we will make yeah, the yeah. normal path clear. So suppose it doesn't stop. Instead of he does can take to some other investigation, which can be therapeutic at the same time. Patient is fine. Uh, sir, uh, 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 Parkinson's transverticular polangiography. Oh. This is not something you do. Transhepatic is an invasive procedure, which is going to hurt and may cause the patient to unnecessarily suffer. This is a patient who is the liver, which is completely destroyed by the abscess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, answer that. We are. Okay. Because it is not settling. If it is settling, then it's okay. If it is not settling, yeah. the pain is going haywire. So don't worry about it. Then we need to make sure that the distal passage is clear. So sure. in one rare scenario, if there is a biliary fistula, just manage it like biliary. If you do the same thing, the normal passage would drain adequately. Sir, yes, we are stenting. Yeah, you can do that, and this is where yeah. it is draining. Or wait for it to become a controlled fistula, and yeah. gradually intervene. Yeah. If there is no hurry. All I wanted to hear was that there is no reason to start doing everything. You mentioned yeah, Ida, yeah. you also yeah. realized it's good. But the good news is that you retreated quickly and allowed the examiner to ask you another question. 
The other mistake is if yeah. you get stuck with the answer, it can be a dangerous scenario. Yeah, yeah. Then, am I visible to you? No, sir. It's not visible. Anyway, yeah, now, sir. So, now you can see me. So he died, yeah. said, then he said, hepatic, which is very, very invasive, right? We'll avoid that. Yeah. In fact, let them stop. That's what I wanted to hear. And we'll observe okay. the patient during this period. What will you do? Nutrition to be taken care of. Electrics to yeah, be taken yeah. care of. IV yes. fuse to be taken care of. A good yeah. cover for antibiotics. What will be your cover for antibiotics? Yes. What will be your antibiotics of choice? Sir, so, uh, initially, sir, broad spectrum antibiotics. What do you mean by that? Sir, like uh, uh, piperacillin, tazobactam, or... Uh... You see, you treat the bacteria, no? Not the human beings. So the bacteria yeah. is going to have which organisms? If there is a connection with the biliary tree, you're looking at E. coli, and e. coli. others can happen with the appendicular perforation. Can be gram-negative organisms. Gram-negative organisms. As well as anaerobes, will provide cover anaerobes. for all. Yes, right. Sir. We yes, can sir. wait. Finally, if we can simply do, we may not put a stent. We can simply do a drainage yeah. procedure of papillotomy, which allows the distal yeah. passage. If the distal passage is, we can leave it alone. It will close. It will close. Yeah. Every yeah. abnormal passage closes if the distal passage is clear. Yeah. Now we are muting and we'll we'll yes, be sir. moving on. Well answered, John. And uh, I hope you learned out of it, which is what the purpose is. And therefore, it's good to volunteer. I'm glad you did. And make your mistakes so that you can learn from them and you can move on. Now the important thing is don't make it into a complicated disease by doing too many investigations, right? And uh, the usual reasons for appendicular abscess leading to liver abscess are the portal pyemia. And how would this patient present? Commonly, a patient with appendicitis having jaundice suspected to be portal pyemia. Now, if there is a patient with appendicitis, all the features of appendicitis, but is also uh, jaundice without past history of jaundice, suspect portal pyemia. The other common cause of portal pyemia and with the kind of pictured appendicitis has in the right iliac fossa is enteric perforation. So these are conditions which you should have in your mind and treat the patient with that kind of a cover. In any case, when you're operating, you'll have the findings. Now, if there is an appendicular abscess, very often you may not be able to do the appendicectomy. You can leave a drain there and you can come out. Appendicectomy can be more uh, damaging if there are adhesions and if it is all stuck. But the approach is as an expert in the protein. You cannot do through the limited incision. It should be managed as a perfusion peritonitis case with liver abscess also, which is rupture. So both can be managed with one laparotomy. You also have an option of doing diagnostic laparoscopy in these patients to make a diagnosis. Maybe less morbid procedures can be done, but very difficult in, a, in an emergency scenario. The other thing, the question that I asked him was of a, basically of a persistent biliary fistula after acute abdomen this is not a case where you will do all sorts of scans or fancy investigations you will be clinical in your approach and the clinical approach is specialized due to the abscess uh, being with a biliary canicular being injured or the liver parenchyma itself is weeping as they say then gradually the color will change it will become serous and if it is becoming serous we know the cavity is shrinking and now it is weeping clear and sometimes there may be a little hemorrhagic tinge to it, which is also a sign of healing. You shouldn't be worried. Finally, this would stop. If it doesn't stop, we have options to, to decompress the distal obstruction by doing papillotomy, which is a good option. There are other options too. I am not denying that you can put in a drain right inside the cavity. You can again do a laparotomy. These are more morbid procedures that you don't need in all the cases. So that was the part of this. So. The question that will be asked, you have been answered already. Pause.
Should the drain be placed in abscess cavity? A lot of people feel that drain itself can cause drainage. And the answer to that I'll take from any student. I'll just pick up. What else could have been done in this case? I'll again take it. Drainage is bilious. We have answered that. What are the causes of non-healing liver abscess? I'll take it from somebody. I'll ask this question and I'll cover it so that somebody can answer. Now, which antibiotic needs to be given? And what should be done if the patient is asymptomatic after six weeks and ultrasound shows a hypoechoic cavity? Please note these questions that I'm going to ask. And management of appendicular perforation. These are four questions that anybody can volunteer quickly. And we have five minutes for that. Otherwise, we'll be missing out on the other cases. Anyone? No. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Now you will take one by one. What are the causes of a non-healing liver abscess oh. and that liver abscess which is not healing? Uh, sir, it can be uh, due to uh, any uh, distal obstruction or uh, ongoing infection and uh, sepsis. And, there is a liver uh, which is not draining. What would you suspect? So that there can be a distal obstruction and uh, the so drain can will have nothing. There will be liver abscess uh, generally would be an independent factor. It's an independent question. Uh, liver abscess, which is not resolving. I'll put it this way. Okay, distal obstruction. What? Mm. So the which type uh, of infection can be which type of infection can be persistent and especially common in this part of the world? Oh, um, Colin, um, sir, I cannot remember as of now. Tuberculosis? Yes, sir. And what else? Any organism which will also not let it heal? Any abscess can persist? Sir, any worms can be there, Clonorchus? Yes, worms. Fungus? Yes, sir. Distal obstruction, fungus? foreign body and tuberculosis yes sir. there's an article you can read on in the this is in uh, bmc surgery which is on needle being there in the liver leading to recurrent abscesses and it went unnoticed completely and it was a sewing needle that um, taylor swallowed by mistake from duodenum it created a fish line to the liver surprisingly very rare case so we had published it the foreign body is one pos possibility the other F is fungal infection. So culture should go for fungus also if it is persisting. Then it can be worms, you're right, which also produce distal obstruction, but never forget tuberculosis in this part of the world. Yes. Okay. Are you happy with the antibiotics that need to be given? What would you like to give? We have covered it partly. Um, so metronidazole, I'd like to add for the appendix perforation. And uh, E. coli, as you said, E. coli uh, will be there. So I can give, I can go for uh, ofloxacin or uh, piperacillin tazobactam. I think that's perfectly all right. Now um, we would give metrogel anyway uh, to a patient who's got liver abscess. You know that. So yes, whether liver abscess or not, we'll still be giving it. Now, what is the precaution you would take if I have to tell you that this patient is also an alcoholic? So metronidazole can cause pancreatitis. But that is pancreas, but he's an alcoholic. Something else can it do? Something that even chloroquine can do. Something that some drugs do in alcoholics. Mm. So have you, have you heard of have you heard of antabuse like effect? So you know diselfiram like Yes, diselfiram is the same thing as antabuse is a name. So al alcoholic should be warned against taking alcohol along with metronidazole. And what does diselfiram actually do? It blocks the conversion of acet acetaldehyde to acetic acid. Right? And acetaldehyde or formaldehyde, they produce blindness, problems and vomitings and lots of problems. So uh, this is where the disulfiram used to be acting. 
and the alcoholic would give up alcohol this is one drug or there are many drugs which produce a similar kind of a picture and that is what is the answer to the question now the third part of the question the last part actually now there is six weeks later this patient has come patient has no symptoms you know, and yes, ultrasound is uh, hypoechoic cavity in the right lobe should we aspirate or we should not so the vitals of the patient i'd like to rescore or... normal patient has normal vitals actually there is no problem with the patient oh, yes sir. then uh, so the size of the uh, cavity the hypoechoic five into five five into five five to five centimeter then i'd like to aspirate so and but it, he's it asymptomatic is. yes so he has on focus on nana six weeks yes sir. burning question that i put asymptomatic previously asked this i equate cavity only cavity you know for a long time but patient has no abscess you don't treat the ultrasound in this case you yes, treat sir. the patient i taught in the other cases in the previous webinar never treat the ct don't read the ultrasound treat the patient patient is asymptomatic by putting in a needle you will infect this cavity even after treatment and when everything has become all right there may still be a cavity cavity would remain for a longer time than the abscess okay yes sir. yes sir. the last question you can take anything different in the management of appendicular abscess sir if it's a uh, app uh, appendicular abscess we won't do appendicectomy we'll just uh, put in a drain we can go retroperitoneally and uh, put in a drain and come out and after six weeks we like go for a yeah, you're right uh, we can or we should we should we can yes Appendicular abscess doesn't need to be drained transperitoneally. Now we have to go extra peritoneally behind and just break into the cavity and leave a drain there and come out. And certainly don't attempt left appendicectomy. Well, thank you very much, Nena. That you answered very well. So we move on to the next case. We unmute. You can unmute yourself. Case three. Uh, he's a middle-aged man, a uh, gentleman who presented with features of gastric outlet obstruction due to chronic gordon ulcer. What do you do? Patient has features of gastric outlet obstruction. What do you do next? Anybody wants to volunteer quickly? Please do volunteers. You can learn better, and others can learn from your answers also. Good afternoon, Karthik. Excellent. What do you do next? This is the case. Middle aged, we are not a detailed one, but this is a ward round scenario. So we are not having a case presentation here. He has features of gastric outer obstruction. What does that mean? And in the case of chronic, chronic, I mean, food, food habits could be the reason for duodenal ulcer. No, duodenal ulcer is there, and gastric outer obstruction, how will you make that diagnosis? Sir, uh, to rule out a gastric, uh, whether there is gastric outlet obstruction, one uh, erect abdomen, chest, chest, I mean. No, no, what history would the patient have? Listen to the question carefully. What would be the clinical way to make a diagnosis? Oh, he, he will be having vomiting. What type of vomiting? Sir, uh, non-bilious. Yes, non-bilious. Or you can say it will depend on the right side of obstruction. Okay. Uh, Next. It will be yeah, with food contents. Previous day's food contents. Previous day's food contents? Uh, sir. I mean, food contents. Sir. Uh. Okay. Food content. Previous day's food content is, no, it's too late, isn't it? Yes, sir. What does it take for the uh, for the food to pass out of the stomach? Sir, it takes four hours, three to four hours. So three to four hours, you should be able to throw it back. What are the other features? 
sir dehydrated due to vomit relax what no, you not answered what i wanted to hear what is the vomiting you should be able to describe it projectile or non projectile sir projectile vomiting you have to say that which comes within 3 hours of taking the yeah, immediately after taking food it like the content that you have mostly non bilious but if the obstruction is bp duodenum which can still produce gastric outward obstruction kind of features it may be bilious but mostly non bilious uh, the pen is writing slowly so i am writing slowly now there is uh, no uh, and uh, there would be other features now how do you proceed next sir what do you do upper gi endoscopy that's the first investigation you would do okay next sir electrolytes i mean in blood investigations i will go for an electrolytes okay so you'll do hematological the biochemistry that is complete blood count and the electrolytes which electrolytes are usually deficient in these patients sir hypochloremia and metabolic alkalosis sir can you speak loudly please hypokalemic hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis i think that's correct what else sir hypocalcemia yes and paradoxical aciduria could be there sir why is there paradoxical aciduria that's very good on clearly man sir due to sir due to dehydration uh, sir actually there will be initially there, there will be the normal i mean initially the, there will be metabolic acid al alkalosis so there will be uh, so carbon mono see, bicarbonate sir sodium bicarbonate yeah. uh, will be increased then further there will be uh, then later uh, sodium absorption along with uh, loss of uh, h plus occurs sir. so it's no so compensatory it is compensatory compensatory there will be so you said you will do upper gi endoscopy first right but you should always mention that i'll do investigations to confirm my diagnosis to support my diagnosis and to treat my patient this is how we usually teach our students please use that it will help you for the benefit of all uh, and to confirm it it's no harm putting in an ultrasound on the abdomen to see whether you got a problem inside the lumen in the wall or outside the wall suppose you put in a scope and the cause is outside there can be a block from a lymph node outside then you would miss out all the we have given you chronic duodenal ulcer but that can coexist so it's a good idea to do an ultrasound to find out whether the pathology is arising from the stomach itself and always good to do in non invasive test before you do an invasive test and then you should mention about in this case the biochemistry is very important and paradox toxic paradoxic aciduria must be discussed and this will be asked in the exam so you covered it nicely and following that we can actually also do an x-ray erect and supine which will show you whether the stomach is distended dilated or not and then of course invasive is always done at the end any role of barium meal in these patients Uh, sir, you, nowadays uh, we are not doing barium. Why are we not doing it? Sir, CT is better than barium. Yeah, everything is better. If I have to get you something to eat, you say pizza is better than chapati. But that's not the way life is. Sometimes you want chapati only. It is what you need. CT is not something you do straight away, right? Why should you do a CT if there is no need? you would exclude a malignancy maybe because the patient is only middle age so that's not a risk involved but ct would be required for staging so investigation to confirm the diagnosis would be one you do an ultrasound and then when you think it's an intraluminal disease you do upper gi endoscopy find the cause and treat it and that's the benign cause now i think we go for the second part to some other first pick take junaid there yes sir junaid unmute yourself and uh, the previous gentleman to kindly unmute himself we have got him out junaid are you online yes sir 
Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Janet. Now we are moving on to the part two of it, uh, which will be. I'll just. Just a second, give me a little time with this pen. Okay, so the procedure done was exploding laparotomy and uncle we got me. So what is your take on this? We have done this or we shouldn't have done it? Hello? Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Can you hear Hello. me, Junet? Yes, Hello, sir. Yes, I sir. Can now I can hear you now. Yeah, I pay attention. The patient was taken up for surgery for gastric outlet obstruction, and uh, laparotomy, laparotomy was done with truncal vagotomy. Hello. Yeah. Am I not audible? Hello. Yeah, Junaid, I can hear you. Are we audible? Hear you. Uh, I can hear now. Yeah, yeah, now, now audible now. Okay, now the management was exploding laparotomy, the trunkle we got me and GJ. That was in five days back. Is that the right treatment? You agree with that, Dr. Dhawal? Yes. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, so we did expert in laparotomy and trunkal vagotomy with GJ. You agree with the treatment? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. Hello? Oh, can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me? Yes, clearly? yes, sir. I can hear you now. Can you answer the question, sir? Please. You're wasting time. We have done expert in laparotomy, trunkal vagotomy, and GJ. Yes, sir. Is that the treatment given is appropriate for the patient. Okay. Why yes, sir. I agree with the patient. Uh, treatment okay. given to the patient. Why? Yes. So listen to me now. Why was trunkal vagotomy required in this case? Yes, sir. I would prefer doing a trunkal vagotomy as the patient is uh, white. If I would see the vital and the general condition of the patient. Okay. And trungal vagotomy procedure in this patient as it is a sequelae of a chronic duodenal ulcer. That is a peptic ulcer, super acidity. All right, then uh, could we have done anything else besides GJ? Any other GJ is a drainage procedure, no? Please speak. Yes, sir. I would prefer. To, I would prefer doing going ahead with a gastrojejunostomy. Why not pyloroplasty, which is also a drainage procedure? Sir, as the duodenum is scarred, the first part of duodenum is also involved. So gastrojejunostomy would be a better drainage procedure as compared to just a pyloroplasty. All right, I agree with you partly. Is there any situation where pyloroplasty is also done? I'm not aware of the same, sir. Good. So we do that if there is a there is a scarring only. So scarring is not a contraindication. We will do that if there is scarring. The reason being, uh, we are going to open up pylorus by doing I'm trying to write because it's writing very slowly so please bear with me because of the connection now we make a longitudinal incision on either side of vein of mayo longitudinal incision made and we close it transversely right that is a simpler procedure a lot of people like to do it especially in benign conditions when there is a peptic ulcer disease so you should be aware of it we did a gastrogenostomy because, as you rightly said, this is an advantage because you are going through an unscarred healthy area, so the anastomosis is likely to do better. So gastrogenostomy would make out would be a better better option. 
but why is the drainage procedure required with truncal wavotomy? Can we do some other procedure which would not require truncal wavotomy? We can go ahead with a highly selective wavotomy, sir, which would not okay. require a drainage procedure. But then the patient has outlet obstruction. So drainage procedure is required anyway. It would not yes, be Yes, sir. Needed. So truncal would be an easier and a faster procedure as compared to going for an HSV. Now HSV has some other disadvantages also. What are the what are those? Since you're answering, sir, so we, I'm interested. Uh, sir, in HSV there is very high chance of leaving behind the criminal nerve of Gracie, which can lead with to HSV, uh, with HSV or SV. Sir, in HSV. Okay. Why do you think that happens in HSV? Sir, because the criminal of Gracie is uh, arises around five centimeter from that of the uh, G junction, so there yes. are high chances we may miss it out, and it may lead to a recurrence of disease. So the criminal nerve of Gracie is a branch of anterior or the posterior vagus trunk. Sir, it is a branch of posterior vagus. Yeah, so it can arise from the anterior also, and the highly selective screen is likely to miss it out, and it is possible. Now, I'll try to show it to you on a board now, so that will be easier on a paper, so that you can understand what we are trying to say. Uh, I'll get into get into the the, the 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 important aspects of it later. Now, can you tell us something about? The need for doing a drainage procedure, colorectomy. Why should we do it, sir? Because it uh, truncal vagotomy also severs the fibers supplying the pylorus for normal relaxation. Yes, that's very good. But where are those uh, fibers usually located, sir? They are uh, generally located they near the G, G. They come high above from the G junction. Okay, I'll just draw for the benefit of everybody the the vagotomy that we know. And uh, okay, I'll show it to you on a paper because this the iPad writing is taking a long time. This is the stomach. The main trunk divides into the left and the right, or the anterior and posterior. You can call it whichever way. And the anterior gives off a branch which is called a hepatic branch. That will supply the liver, gallbladder, etc. And the hepatic gives off a branch which is a pyloric branch. And then it continues down as anterior nerve of lethargic, which en ends at crowfoot. This is the crowfoot. And on its way, it gives off the parietal branches. It supply the P cells that produce pepsin, which is related to acid. And the posterior continues down as posterior now of lethargic with its branches to the celiac plexus, which is also called as solar plexus because of the look, because the sun ray appears. Now, the criminal now of Grassi can arise from here as well as from here, and it can go and to supply the fungus. So, this becomes an important. Nerve which can be missed in this process, as rightly answered, because it goes parallel. But the other disadvantage of highly selective agotomy is that it can produce, along with this, the blood vessels also go, which are end arteries. It can produce an ischemic spots can lead to formation of ulcers. So, highly selective agotomy is taxing, takes more time, and doesn't have great advantages. And uh, the Drainage procedure with truncal vagotomy is mandatory because the pylorus loses its supply. The options are you can do pyloroplasty, which is uh, which is as I described. I'm now trying to give a better picture. You make a longitudinal incision and you close it transversely. There are various types: Finney came, uh, etc. So we are not going into the details here. Finney's other methods. We do a gastrogenostomy. And it is very well known that anterior versus posterior or anticholic versus retrocholic doesn't change the outcome. 
it's only cancer that you're concerned that you don't want to uh, do a retrocolic one for the fear of opening up another channel of spread. The drainage is good with retrocolic. Well, that was uh, beautifully answered by you. And I thought, in fact, the discussion went higher because you were answering that well. Now, thank you, sir. There would be some, there would be some more questions which you will be keen on answering, and I'm glad you volunteered. Therefore, I'm moving to the other questions related to it, which I've covered mostly. If this was a malignancy, would you still be needing uh, regotomy? Are you there? Yes, sir. I'm there. Yes, sir. I can hear you. Would you still be needing a regotomy? You don't know. That's okay. No, sir. Not it's in a covered. case of malignancy. Why? Why don't we need it? Sir, because we are not dealing with any uh, increased acid production in a case of malignancy. On the contrary, what do you have? Uh, I didn't get you. Yes, sir. Echlorhydra, yes. Yeah, and a lot of people think that we don't need it at all because these days it is possible to put the patient on pump inhibitors and you're very correct in answering that if the patient is stable then and very very young you don't want to put the patient on proton pump inhibitors for a very long time that is where you do it since the patient fell in that age group and the feet patient was stable so we went ahead and did a gastrogenostomy but uh, sorry trunkal vagotomy otherwise you may not do it may not be may not be required so we have covered that part why was it done we have covered and uh, the types of egotomy, we have I have covered that already. And uh, my apologies on the way it is writing, but don't worry. The drainage procedure, why it was done, was covered. Indication of pyroplasty, we have discussed. I think we have covered it up. And if anybody else was key, any and gastro gastrostomy versus jejunostomy, we am just extrapolating the question. What is the difference between other types of gastrostomy? When do you do gastrostomy? When do you do jejunostomy? If you can answer that. What are the indications for gastrostomy usually? Uh, sir, gastrostomy is usually done when uh, we are planning to give uh, feeds for feeding purposes. Uh, especially in patients with uh, G junction malignancies or in injury patients. So is it something that you see frequently done at your place? Uh, not not as a part of malignancy palliation, but definitely as a part of uh, head injury or uh, chronic intubated patients. Well, I won't take it away from you, but by and large, just trust me, is not something that we fancy these days. Can you tell me why is it not a good a good option? Uh, sir, I am not aware of the advantages of disadvantages are the aspiration, the benefit of all, and feeding genostomy is what most people prefer. And then they can also do a peg that they can do a yes, a spontaneous. So it's it's simple these days. But yes, gastrostomy is is what is done in a lot of situations. One should rule it out. But in most cases, where you are going to use stomach for a pull up, say in malignancy for piece of feathers. Or in crico or corrosive structures, etc., where the stomach itself may be diseased, you may not do a gastrostomy. So wherever you're going to use stomach, or wherever you think the stomach is not good enough, we may go for feeding gastrostomy. Otherwise, you can use it, and it's very really comfortable. There's no harm. The only risk is risk of aspiration. So that is what has taken it away out of fashion. We've done many, many, many. What are the types of feeding gastrostomy? Can you tell us? For the benefit of others, uh, sir, we can do a Witzeling method as well as a Stamos method. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but, uh, no procedure has advantage over either. Actually, Witzeling was initially done for the uh, uh, reducing the chances of a leak peri uh, jejunostomy site, but both of these okay. procedures have the same leak rates and same complication rates. Do you know these terms, Witzel and Stam? Are originally the types of gastrostomy, not jejunostomy. 
people yes, are sir, they were originally described as gastrostomy so and in i'll just try and use draw it and show you it is not a very good method to i mean we do these days putting two purse strings and just putting the outer one fixing it to the parietes the the other methods included creating a zero muscular tunnel uh, which actually gets through in it in a jejunum it will narrow the opening it will narrow the jejunum produces obstruction just put one purse string and let it hang it can cause torsion or rotation and the classical stam was not stabbed it will be opened and there will be a flap of uh, zero muscular or the whole wall which will be wrapped around the tube so it was done for permanent gastrostomies in the past the terms have been extrapolated into jejunum although not correctly so you should be clear that they are not the same in both so we have types of jejunostomies which have been modified based on the gastrostomies that we both as you rightly said have equal role in terms of they work equally well in terms of the the drainage and the feeding but the complication rates with one where we make a tube or we do a flap is higher in jejunum because it cause narrowing and i'll show it to you on a board and it will hopefully be visible i'm just trying to show you various types which should be well seen now and uh, you can meanwhile keep your questions ready for the for the part that so here if there is any doubt you can ask me now what they used to do in gastrostomy was very simple can you give me the sentence coming up very now the now we could do a purse string and then the other purse string to the other side the tube goes in and we tie the inner purse string holding onto the thread with an artery forceps then we tie the outer purse string to bury it in and that was the standard stem but when you are doing it permanent one what was done was they'll create a flap say they open up a they make an opening and at this end they will keep a flap of this disc was taken up by the this was the disc here taken up by the flap so the tube goes in the same way you put a purse string and then you put the tube through this flap and we close the flap over it that used to form some kind of a permanent thing and it will be fixed to the skin that would be the combination of stam and witzel that was done in gastrostomy and that's where the terms became excuse me sir let sir, me we are not able to see what you are drawing uh that now that's witzel and stam now the so this is was the flap that we had used which was here earlier and we have done a put the tube this is closed then we use the flap to make a tube over the gastrostomy tube and then we fix it to the skin it used to be permanent and after some time we'll remove the tube and this will serve as a stoma that's why the term gastrostomy and you'll feed through this this was the classical method of making a flap and getting it out now the same done in jejunum would obviously cause a lot of narrowing Classically, in jejunum, we would now be using, say, a loop you have decided, which you pick up at least three arcades away from the DJ. Then you have a proximal part. I am saying three arcades because centimeters cannot be measured. Now we will have a purse string put, then another one put. Inside it is tied. and inside the outer one we bury it in now you have to bear with us because the internet connection is slow and we are still trying to i'm still trying to show it so if it comes into focus it will show better okay 
So, and we just dry it, and then the needle is still intact, and we switch it to the variety completely so that it gets stuck as one segment here. It does not rotate. This is the segment I'm talking about. It's come here. Now, if you just press thing and let it fix, it might rotate and cause torsion. The other thing is a lot of people make a incision some distance in the serosa and then split slight distance away from it in the mucosa. So there is a tunnel through which the tube goes, which is similar to what is being done here, but jejunum being a narrow tube, it can produce obstruction. So there is a there is a problem with extrapolating what you got in gastrostomy into what you want to do in gastrostomy. So don't use these terms interchangeably, although a lot of people do that. I hope that's clear. We can again discuss it further and we'll move on in the next case. So I thought I'll take that opportunity to clarify that part of it. Now, moving on to the next case. I think in this case, there was one question. Are you still there? Yes, sir. I'm there, sir. Yeah, fourth day post-operative. There is hemorrhage in the uh, in the Ryle's tube. I'll just show you that question. Going back. So there is blood in the nasogastric tube, one fourth day. Don't use the term Ryle's tube. I already described it, uh, that George Ryle had invented that tube with a pediatrician actually that was the rubber tubes what we use today is nasogastric tube don't call it rice tube it's a wrong term you can use it but that's not correct what do you do both day management yes sir. quickly this sir, i would like to observe the patient initially i would like to monitor the vitals uh, and uh, sir, i would like to do a upper gi scopy as this likes uh, seems to be a bleed from the suture side so if an endoscopic management of the same is possible i would like to apply a hemoclip or a sort of uh, endoscopic management if not we may have to open up the patient and do over sewing of the anastomotic lines all right is it possible that the the ulcer that you thought was silent has started bleeding now would the management change well i take your answer uh, we would initially, I am repeating it for others, just, just bear with me. So we'll, first of all, stabilize the patient. Don't just jump to uh, treatment straight away. We will stabilize the patient and we'll make it a point that patient is uh, hemodynamically stable. We do not, don't rush into endoscopy or anything initially. A lot of times it settles a good gastric lavage using normal saline. And if it settles, then we don't need to really go too far into are trying to do endoscopic clipping, etc. But those are the options which will exercise once you are uh, looking at some patient who's hemodynamically not getting better. Hemodynamically stable patient doesn't need too much. Attention. A lot of time these, yes, sir. these are explosions which stop bleeding. And if, ha if they're happening on the fourth day, they can be possibly due to what kind of a hemorrhage will this be on fourth day? Primary? Secondary or reactionary? Sir, it will be a secondary hemorrhage. So what is the usual cause for that? Uh, sir, what either it can... I'll leave that uh, question. Reactionary, sir. So if it is a vessel which has slipped off, sloughed off, or the anastomotic vessel has got... To be, is it the gastric one or the jejunal one commonly? Sir, gastric one. Yes. So endoscopy they serve the purpose. And many a times, just a lavage can take care of that. And it is not a major vessel that is bleeding. You would have done it on first or second day. That's why I put fourth day. So fourth day is sloughing off. Yes. So we can we can wait and it might settle. So that is, that is how you should look at it. Thank you very much. We are unmuting. You answered very well. Therefore, we could discuss so well. Thank you. Muting. Now we go to the next scenario and quickly cover up all of them. There are plenty of them. So otherwise we'll miss out. We'll do our best to take as many as we can. Meanwhile, 
please participate. There's actually no other way, way, way to go for the ward rounds. This is. Uh, so this is a case of carcinoma stomach. He is a, a 60 years gentleman who presented with features of gastric outlet obstruction. Again. Now, uh, actually, um, more or less on similar lines. I think we have covered it. We'll do the same approach here. We'll have an ultrasound done. And uh, uh, we can actually do the uh, ultrasound abdomen to look for whether it's an interluminal disease and in the same in the same go we can then do an upper G endoscopy we'll do a workup for carcinoma stomach like we always do so that is how your answer would be anybody who's keen on answering i'll be happy to give you an opportunity because this is a takeaway question good afternoon Dhawal. what will you do next quickly uh, first i evaluate a uh, upper GI endoscopy and uh, do uh, upper GI so uh, you, uh, EUS to rule out the extension of the disease in the stomach and then we can plan according to uh, CCT for uh, any meds is present a uh, distal meds is also present or not and then we can plan uh, uh, neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy okay let's stop there let's stop there now the patient has got gastric outlet obstruction do you think it's an early gastric cancer or it's a late gastric cancer the gastric outlet syndrome uh, if uh, malignancy is in uh, lower gi uh, area so may present with the gastric outlet obstruction i'm asking you a question is it early it's early or late it's mostly most likely is a late uh, presentation so what would endoscopic ultrasound do here Endoscopic ultrasound is nothing to contribute in this case. So don't use investigations unnecessarily. You'll approach the same way, investigation to diagnosis to support the diagnosis, then to stage and treat. Because diagnosis will do ultrasound abdomen to know it's in the stomach, and then we'll do upper G endoscopy, get a biopsy, and we'll move on. To stage it, we'll do a contrast and CT scan, and based on that staging, we'll proceed with the treatment. And neurogen chemotherapy would be required if a patient in a locally advanced disease which is the response is very limited most of the time the palliation is also surgery that would have been your answer rather than endoscopic ultrasound you don't need endoscopic ultrasound and we are not doing metastatic workup using ct on ultrasound also you can see the metastasis where, where does it go usually to the liver so so we can find it on ultrasound also now uh, the connection being slow we are I, I, we are losing some people because of that. I hope they join back. Now, um, moving on to the next scenario. The procedure done was, you can stay there, uh, Dhawal. Given gastrectomy okay. with Ruan Y, gastrogenostomy and feeding gastrogenostomy was done five days back. Presently, the patient is afebrile, asymptomatic, wound is healthy. Okay. Now, okay. what is... Uh, uh, what is D1 gastrectomy, Dhawa? Uh, yeah, in the D1 gastrectomy and D2 gastrectomy, in the level of lymph node we have dissected is uh, divided into D1 and D2. In mostly the uh, uh, near to pyloric region, we have already uh, always do the D1 uh, gastrectomy with lymph node di dissection uh, up to the level six lymph node. Uh, and uh, station six, not level six, station six. Okay, so you should yes. be clear on that. We yes. will not venture into D2 and D3 in this case. It is clear the patient was locally advanced, and we were mostly just palliating it by doing the kind of gastrectomy that we did. Now, what is syndrome? Uh, in the efferent lobe and efferent lobe, after the gastrojejunostomy, we have created two lobes. Uh, uh, gastrojejunostomy uh, uh, proximal lobe uh, in which uh, the bile duct and uh, pancreatic duct uh, through uh, ampulla of water is uh, opening is called efferent loop and distal loop is called efferent loops and uh, the uh, and uh, in the uh, drainage procedure uh, drainage of the uh, fluid is uh, inadequate and can you hear me sir Yes, very well. So, yes. what is dumping? 
in the uh, drainage is uh, is not uh, moving uh, and uh, leads to the i cannot uh, uh, convey because i am some little confused between uh, your answer with uh, dump <laughs> no, no don't worry you answered it very well the dumping can be prevented by taking care of the upper and loop not being very very long and uh, at the same time uh, the patient takes small meals rather than a uh, lot of meals at the same time. Uh, similarly, the blind loop prevented because when you do V2, uh, that is the build rod 2, what will happen is you will have an element which is uh, going to prevent it. Basically, the problems with blind loop are they could be um, bacteria which are static and it may cause infection and uh, it can cause kind of diarrhea. But dumping is, a, is an issue. Now, I'm glad there are one more question there, and then we'll move to the next one because we covered this part. Now, what are the, the complications of gastrogenostomy? You can quickly answer, or I'll tell you. Gastrogenostomy can stop bleeding, or it can cause bleeding. And it can also, in some situations, it can be narrow and it may be infiltrated by cancer itself. Therefore, in most gastric cancers, we do anticholic rather than anticholic gastrogenostomy. Uh, that's the and we don't want to open up the zone of retrocolic compartment for spread of the cancer uh, by and large how long will you keep the nasogastric tube in situ we'll not leave it for a long time because we don't need it and the tube itself delays the peristalsis because the uh, the pacemaker of peristalsis is in the fundus of stomach audio connection can you hear me can you hear me yes sir yeah, the the uh, the the problem is the uh, the the issue. With, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Uh, the advantage is that you. I mean, uh, the problem is that uh, in situations where you do um, you leave the nasogastric tube for a long time, and if the fundus is irritated. The ileus may not happen, but the ileus may happen. So patient may have a delayed recovery from bowel sounds. I was trying to check many things at one time, so therefore I lost that part. So uh, essentially, you would not keep it for long. It should not be. And some of us have a practice of pushing the nasogastric tube beyond the anastomosis for initial few days, so that the anastomosis remains uh, patent. Although that is not its role. The role is to drain bile initially. From the loop which is not functional so that you can keep it dry to the extent you can and when it's draining bile it's a sign that the the anastomosis is working fine so that's that's about this case i think we'll move to the next case and thank you very much Dawal, for participating and you answered well but don't jump to answers like i'll do endoscopic ultrasound because you could see that this is endoscopic ultrasound has a role in staging early breast early uh, stomach cancer and also to find out about the lymph nodes around the uh, stomach. So it is not really necessary in this case. Don't just say endoscopic ultrasound just because you've read it. And don't jump to CT scan unless you've done an ultrasound. Because there are situations, if on ultrasound you find the liver is studded in metastasis, you may not need a CT scan at all because that's a disseminated disease. Or if there is ascites, then you may not need it. I hope that's clear. You answered it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the next case and i'll try to cover myself most of it so that we can have more of you participating i was hoping now give me an answer i want an answer i hope you are liking this interactive way otherwise i can make it didactic quickly so please answer by writing your yes so that i know 25 years patient presented to uh, emergency with perforation peritonitis with an aparche 2 score of 15 intraoperatively a large duodenal ulcer was found in the first part of the so that's a that's a suspected the giant duodenal ulcer, which is defined as an ulcer with a diameter of more than 1.5 centimeters. And we have given you the score, so it helps here to know that the score is not too good. And the score being more than around 15, it's not a good case. So we, although we cannot use the Apache to score for all perforations, primarily we use for therapy of the ileal perforations. But for uh, in this case, it is a case with a large duodenal ulcer. Or a giant urinal ulcer 
it's in the first part so what do we do we cannot do something usual we cannot be putting a, a mental patch or we cannot cannot be uh, doing standard uh, fontana patch fontana patch is where we use falciparum very sorry falciform ligament to cover it we can use a serosal patch to cover it but in a giant ulcer you need to do something different and the options are many they these all options together are called duodenal diverticulization procedures they can be triple tube pyloric exclusion and gastrojejunostomy or some people like to do a t-tube drainage and uh, they these patients don't have a very good answer, response to anastomosis and anastomosis don't heal very well in these patients so a lot of people are not very happy with pyloric exclusion and gastrojejunostomy they i mean they don't do very well a lot of surgeons are not very happy with that sorry now Pyloric exclusion and gastrogenostomy is a good option if the patient's Apache score is good. But with a score like this and a giant general ulcer, do not answer that. We will put on a mental patch, and that's the end of the story. So that's what we are going to do. We are going to basically, it's a surgical question, totally asking what exactly would you do surgically. The answer is we will proceed with one of the duodenal diverticulization procedures. And there are many. You can see the patient in the picture. And uh, the options could be, I mean, many in the form of, once you find it's a donal ulcer perforation, you can actually find that the options would vary depending upon whether you can actually do a lateral diagnostomy is one procedure that we people do very frequently, along with a feeding diagnostomy. What that does is it will allow us to get the duodenum drained and to keep the bile uh, out so that we are comfortable and then we do a feeding diagnostomy here which will be a good method to put that bile back into circulation so a tube goes in and uh, the uh, the the option is i mean i hope it is visible there only so one is lateral diagnostomy along with the i'm just writing on the board so that you can see it's a giant ulcer also perforation in the first part so we have an option of keeping the duodenum dry this is dj and that's jejunum Drying, keeping it dry is, is called the diverticulization procedure. Diurnal diverticulization. So, what can we do? We put in a polysia or string here. We can guide either a nasogastric tube beyond, or we can do a feeding diagnostomy and a lateral diagnostomy. This is lateral diagnostomy. This is feeding diagnostomy. The advantage of doing this is that we can also the bile that comes out of here we can feed it back in and some people like to do a triple tube which is where you have one tube is this the other tube is either a gastrostomy or it's a nasogastric tube and the third tube is it goes back retrograde into the duodenum so the three tubes are i'm not making them with black so you don't confuse either the Nasogastric tube, which is guided beyond proximal diagnostomy, it comes out separately in a feeding diagnostomy. So, one, two, and three. But this usually doesn't do very well. We have not seen it do very well because the lumen is larger than the tube. So, there will be peritubal leak. What instead we do is we put a lateral diagnostic which seals it completely and we fix it to the parietal. the serosal patch also happens because this is peritoneum it will seal it completely and the bile that comes out we start feeding it back into this the jejunum so that the patient has bile which you know has got protective role i have discussed it in the previous webinar so these are the options so don't just say i will put in a uh, I'll put in a I'll put in a I'll put a patch there because the patch won't work. 
because the batch would leak. Some people also like to do what is called as this is the opening. So they do what? They push a nasogastric tube through it and the suture momentum to it and pull it back. So the momentum stuffs it. But I've seen that momentum necrosis and it becomes it's an it's not a good procedure. They should be familiar with it. And you should not say that I'll just do the patch, which is what I'm saying. Otherwise, a lot of you would answer for us for a simple one. You can say modified Gram's patch, which means pedicle momentum being placed into position. Where if there is a perforation like this here, you put the switches and we let it go. The patch is here, and you don't make it too tight. We start by tying this first, then this, and then this. So that we don't strangulate the momentum. That's a modified gram set, which is not used here. The other option is serosal patch, where you have a jejunum loop coming, and we cover this with a jejunal loop, the serosa. These are various options which you will talk about in, in making it possible to uh, take care of a giant journal ulcer. Now, I'll move on. If there is anybody to volunteer, we maybe can we can take it at the end of it so that we can save on time, which is important. And we have some very we have taken up a lot of abnormal scenarios, which is what you have requested. But I would request you all to make an effort to be part of it. So that's that's the whole purpose of doing the word round since you asked for it. Now I would uh, the questions about triple tube placement, which I've covered, which is done in this case. And as I mentioned, it's not a great option, and the dis disadvantages are obvious. And uh, what are the various options for management of this ulcer? I've covered it, and I think you can easily use it for purpose that is described. So we move to the next scenario. This was a scenario of. Abdominal, uh, the the jandial ulcer perforation. Now we move on, and uh, I would request people to volunteer to be part of it. Otherwise, I'll just take it forward as I do. <laughs> so, a 20 years gentleman presented to the emergency with alleged history of high velocity motor vehicle accident. He sustained blunt injury to the abdomen. There is no history of loss of consciousness, vomiting, ear, nose, throat bleeding, or hematuria. So, anybody who wants to volunteer? Let's move. That's complete. Right. So, on examination, the blood pressure was 98 by 73 millimeters of mercury and the pulse rate was 112 beats per minute. On abdominal examination, it was slightly distend, distended with diffuse tenderness present. Bowel sounds were sluggish and a Pache 2 score was 4. Now, we will keep moving. Ultrasound fast was done and it showed free fluid in the Morrison's pouch, perihepatic and perisplenic space with internal echoes, suggestive of hemoperitoneum. Now, anybody wants to volunteer? What next? Otherwise, I'll move on. First of all, I hope you are able to see us. Okay, can you raise his volume? Even That's he can raise. Now, uh, Okay, so uh, right, you will first treat the patient as you rightly said, and then you will investigate. Now, that's one thing, and if the patient is not settling, you will go for surgery. What incision, what approach? So, midline laparotomy incision. Can you please uh, increase the Can volume? Increase the volume of your own. Uh, this thing, you are not audible clearly, your volume is very low. Can you raise Hello? Yeah, now it's better. So you raise it so that you can hear it. Now you speak. So we'll give a midline laparotomy incision starting right from ZK sternum up to the pubic symphysis for a better visualization. You have done the laparotomy and the findings are on the screen. 1.2 liters of blood. And a 4, four into 3 centimeter 
horizontal tear and mesentery with active bleeding 2.5 feet from ileocecal junction how would you manage so uh, we'll first uh, drain the blood uh, clear the uh, view for us and as it is a horizontal tear that we can see uh, which should have compromised the uh, bowel vascularity so we'll go for resection and anastomosis but no not resection and anastomosis sir we'll uh, do a uh, stomy uh, proximal ileostomy or double barrel ileostomy as patient is unstable and resection and anastomosis no what was the score what was the apache score of this page okay, it's four sir yeah four I'll so we can go for four. anastomosis and in a trauma case, the Apache score is usually good because they have no chronic illness, right? So we can anastomose. But I appreciate that you said we'll resect because it's a transverse horizontal tear. So the vascularity can be a challenge. Well, very well answered. What else will you do? Where all you will look for uh, the uh, blood in this case? Suppose there was, I'm just extrapolating the question. There was just a mesenteric hematoma, bleeding has stopped, and the bowel is looking viable. Would you still be resecting? No. So no. how would you consider it's a viable bowel? Uh, we'll look for the mesenteric pulsations. Uh, we'll look for the shininess of the bowel, uh, the luster of the bowel. Then, uh, what else? And the uh, peristalsis. <coughs> Yes, and uh, I'll give you all the marks for that. <clears throat> Look for it, and do not just rush into resection all the time, because sometimes the, the 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 blood supply may be adequate. But I take your point very very nicely. Anybody would be happy to hear that because you took into consideration the fact that it is horizontal. You took into consideration that bowel may be devascularized. You took into consideration that we'll resect. And benefit of doubt should go to the patient. If the score is four, we are fine. But recheck the score. Make sure that the patient is stable. And patient score is what will dictate your decision. Because if you just casually look at it, you will bring a stoma out in almost every patient, which adds to the morbidity. But that's very well answered. Patient anastomosis, making sure that the would you leave a drain or you won't? I would leave a drain. Why do you want to drain it? So because uh, if there was um, every NS do drain. Yes, sir. What is the protocol? There is no such protocol. There is no need of a drain. But there is a possibility. That you would have missed out some injury although there is no diagnostic role of drains and most cases where the score is four you've done an anastomosis hemodynamically the patient is stable you don't see any soiling in the abdomen there is no purulent material there is no feculent material you can actually leave it as such because drain themselves cause problems in 48 to 72 hours most drains get blocked so don't put a drain to diagnose leak, which is a wrong trend. You leave a drain there. Uh, if there is a possibility or there is a suspicion that there is an injury which you have missed, which is again, you should search for it. And diagnostic, uh, I'm an extraordinary laparotomy. I've described it in a webinar earlier, unexpected laparotomy last time, unexpected encounters. You must trace it from pelvis right up to the right side. That is the ascending colon, hepatic flexure, transverse colon, Splenic flexure, descending colon, splenic, uh, the sigmoid colon, and down to the rectum. Exclude any other injury. And once you've done that, I don't think there is a need to put a drain all the time. And remember, drains don't function when you need them to function. But thank you. That was very well done. I have thoroughly enjoyed interacting. And that's the way it goes forward. And you can also type your question if you have any in the, at the end. Thank you. You unmute yourself. Now, the patient had, as expected, an un uneventful recovery and uh, did well and discharged. So, 
well answered well taken i think we move on to the basic scenarios now the net is a little slower unfortunately now there is this case and i'll get nana on please unmute yourself nana you wanted a case like that to be discussed she's here good afternoon the case is being read out to you and i'm sure you will you will take it keep the volume high please Now, can you read out the question? Yes, That's okay, whatever. The case of left sided inguinal hernia with swelling in the left side inguinal region for past one year, which was reducing on its own on lying down. But for past one day, the swelling has become non reducible. On examination, there is non tender soft swelling in the left inguinal region, which has absent cough impulse and normal overlying skin. What do you do next? Tell us the do's and don'ts, Nana. So it's a non-tender swelling, and uh, so uh, yeah. it is not stunted. And um, so I'd ask for the um, patient passing a uh, patient is passing flitters in motion. Yes. And so it is not obstructed also, and uh, but it is uh, non-reducible. It is irreducible. irreducible for the last twenty-four hours. It is not obstructed. And the skin overlying is normal, and with the absent cough impulse, sir, absent cough impulse. Yes. Um, so then I'd uh... tell me the management now. You've got it all on the board. It's a irreducible left-sided inguinal hernia with patient having no features of triangulation, as you rightly said, and as of now. No features of obstruction. How should we proceed? Oh, so we can uh, uh, try a taxes for once, and okay. then we can. Yeah. And Carry on. You can... finish. Board. So. Yes. So the last uh, comment was not uh, audible to me. No, no. I said you carry on. You first finished, and I'll ask you. So one so, is taxes. Uh, Sir, I'll uh, try to um, uh, I'll uh, adduct the um, uh, left leg of the patient and uh, um, uh, flex it at the hip joint, and uh, with the one hand over the swelling and one hand over the um, uh, superficial inguinal ring, I uh, I'll try to um, uh, reduce the swelling. Uh, but if it uh, but it can uh, if it is not possible, then I'd like to go for a surgery. Okay. I'd like to go for a um, uh, local incision. Now I'll stop you there. Now, Nana, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Taxes has disappeared from use. Yes, sir. Never, never do taxes. Every irreducible hernia is to be treated as a obstructed or strangulated hernia unless proven otherwise. Okay, sir. Risk of taxes is whatever procedure you are describing. What is the complication of taxes? Sir, it can go if it, the hernia is already strangulated. The, um, uh, no. the toxic. The term is reduction and mass. And yes, please, if you remember it, we never, never, never do taxes. If you've seen anybody do it, he's doing something which is not with evidence. It's wrong. Okay, sir. Are the first thing is reduction in mass, which means what? You have an obstructed, you have a band of hernia somewhere here. The hernia gets reduced along with the obstruction. It goes in, completely. arm block. So it's called reduction in mass. It goes in completely. So that's a serious problem. To the extent yes. that it can cre create perforation in the bowel. I have operated on patients post axis perforation because when you are negotiating it through using some ice packs putting the foot end up making a chopper out of the patient and making it impossible it is all bunk up no longer done please remember it for future yes. what do we do the answer is surgery there is no confusion yes for everybody 
treatment of irreducible or complicated hernia surgery. <coughs> right? Because you yes, cannot sir. for sure say it is obstructed or strangulated or not. Correct? Yeah, that's an intraoperative finding. Yes, that's different. No Texas is what I wanted to highlight here. <coughs> but you can put the patient on sedatives. Yes, and relax. Sir. Let him lie supine and the hernia may go back itself. That can happen in some patients. And patient can give you a history that this has happened many times and it has gone back. So these yes, are patients. Sir. You will put the patient on sedatives. And no lifting of the foot end of the bed and making anything helicopter out of the patient. That is not done. And never, never, never Texas. So Texas is an absurd, wrong thing to do in any irreducible structure. And don't get me wrong, but that is the way you'll remember it. Yes, sir. Surgery. So what surgery should we do? You said we will make an incision. It should be inguinal scrotal rather than inguinal incision. Yes, sir. The inguinal scrotal. What is it that we do differently in a obstructed hernia from a hernia? We open so we the want, sac first. Yes, sir. So we open the sac and see the the, the state of the contents, the fluid, and uh, if the uh, uh, right? the, the top the, fluid. Yes, and then, the steaming with bacteria. We can't let it go in, and we also yes, look sir. at the state the content whether it's ischemic infected or whatever so no texas and opening the sac first and we don't put a mesh because it's a contaminated field so do's and don'ts of this case i just wanted to discuss patient has been catheterized do you think it's a good practice so if we if it's uh, if we are suspecting uh, it can be a sliding hernia then uh... excellent excellent 100 out of 100 you can have a slide, you may not have a slide, but these patients may have retention subsequently in the surgery also during surgery, after surgery. So it's a good practice to put in a catheter and that takes also care of a slide in an emergency scenario, but no mesh. Yes, sir. We'll do a tissue repair and I'm not discussing them here. We'll have a session on groin swelling some other time. So that was what I wanted to highlight in this case and in the ward round, this is what will be asked. And if there is any question, thank you, Nana. If there is any question from anybody, he can type it down and we can take that question and we'll move on to the next scenario very quickly. I want to get a feedback from all of you. I hope you're all able to hear us and it is making sense. Now the questions are there on the screen. The same questions would be asked and maybe you can answer them. What is incarceration? Nana, are you still there? Yes, sir. So incarceration is um, uh, when there is a tender swelling and the blood supply to the um, uh, hernia contents is blocked. So uh, uh, is, that will. Is it the same? No, is it the same? Uh, no, it is strangulated. Uh, sorry, sir. So that is strangulated hernia. Incarcerated hernia is uh, like irreducible hernia, uh, but. Uh, so there's one it's difference which I'm not. Nor is it strangulated, right? And incarceration yes. is, which means imprisonment. You know, if somebody is put in the jail, it's called incarceration. And the prisoner is usually alive. You don't keep dead people in the jail. So it's an intact hernia. And the yes. it is impossible because you close the main door, the window is very small. So it is not able to come out. And classically, if you see the picture in the in the um, in the in the scenarios of uh, the books, they show a small bowel content with the fecolith inside, which is causing the scenario. But incarceration is not the same thing as strangulated hernia. Obstructed is only when it's a lumen when that is gone in. When if it is a momentum, you can't have obstruction. But strangulation can happen to all of them. And strangulation means cutting off the blood supply. There are more symptoms with obstructed hernia, but there are more signs with strangulated hernia, which you must remember. Role of Texas, we have discussed. Herniography, herniaplasty, we have discussed. What is a phantom hernia? No, sir. I don't have one. I'll leave a question for, for all, uh, everybody to answer at the end. I'm leaving this question for all those who are participating. 
Now, thank you very much, Nana. You can unmute. You can mute yourself. You've done very well. 18 years gentleman who presented with uh, chief complaints of abdominal pain for past two days, high grade fever for, for past one day, and multiple episodes of bilious vomiting for past one day. There is history of blunt trauma to the lower abdomen uh, sustained in a fist fight. On examination, his blood pressure is 100 by 80 millimeters of mercury, pulse rate of 108 beats per minute, and respiratory rate of 18 breaths per minute. Uh, he is febrile with 101.2 degree Fahrenheit. On per abdominal examination, it was distended and tense. There was generalized tenderness with guarding and rigidity. No organomegaly could be appreciated. Percussion showed no free fluid in the abdomen and auscultation revealed absence of bowel sounds. These are the laboratory investigations. Hemoglobin is 13.7 and TLC of 8700. Platelets 75,000 with LFT, KFT and the electrolytes with the normal limits. ABG also with the normal limits and the Apache 2 score of 1. The partial pressure of oxygen is 88.5 and saturation is 99%. This is the chest x-ray. What next? Who's going to volunteer quickly? We'll, we'll move fast. Let's take somebody who's willing. Yes. Dr. Ashish Kamatham, please unmute yourself. Yeah, what next? You can see the x-ray and tell us quickly what do you do next? Uh, the last abdominal the, case, we have to move the chest. Yeah, quickly. On the x-ray finding, uh, no any uh, air fluid level is seen. Or no gas under okay. diaphragm, and uh, on the chest rib cage, uh, no any chest wall injury is also seen, and okay. slightly crown glass opacity seen in the abdomen. Uh, I want to do USG fast for uh, rule out the collection okay. any uh, abdominal collection in the uh, Morrison's pouch or. Uh, pelvic cavity okay and uh, uh, and sir uh, asking the history of a patient to passing platus and stool to see the uh, their bowel mo mobility and uh, bowel viability hmm. yes and then the according and uh, 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 after the USG report, we, I can uh, proceed further. Actually, would you like to look at the X-ray chest again? I'm just expanding it if I can. We can't expand it. So, something here. Uh, I could not be difference. This, this is looking like a normal abdominal uh, appearance or it's a glass. Yeah. It's a gra ground glass appearance, so my might be hemoperitoneum is uh, suspected. I have to on the X-ray basis. No, but look carefully. The X-ray quality may not be very good, but uh, you can still look for. Can you look for some gas under the diaphragm? Look carefully. Yes, yeah, sir. On the left side, I have to uh, yes. slightly gas under the diaphragm. Now, does it make a difference to your approach? You've already got history of trauma. Yeah. Uh, so, the the gas part. I have, so I have to plan the exploratory laparotomy. Uh, due to the Apache one, so I can, uh, patient is stabilized, so I can uh, proceed the patient to OT and uh, exploratory laparotomy and see the bowel perforation or any. Uh, Yes. I'll tell you the findings. You agreed on laparotomy. So it is moving slow. So I'm taking a little time. I don't think I'm. Abdominal examination also revealed. The abdominal findings were there, which we discussed with you. Did you listen to them carefully? Your features suggestive of the liver dullness was also masked. So you should look, listen to the story carefully. And intraoperatively, there is distal ileal perforation, 1.5 to 1.5 centimeter. Which is 130 centimeter proximal to IC junction, which was repaired primarily. Another proximal perforation of 0 0.5 into 0 0.5 centimeter, 160 centimeters proximal to IC junction, which was taken out as loop ileostomy. The patient underwent exploratory laparotomy with peritoneal lavage with double barrel ileostomy and primary repair of the distal perforation with drain placement. 
Now you can see I presented to you a contrast. If the patient has a score of one, you would do a closure. Why should we do exteriorization? It's not necessary, but it can go wrong. It's a scenario which is different from what normally we teach. If the score is less than 10, why should we do an ileostomy? It is actually required. That's where yeah. you take the decision. Get but, the point? Uh, Your answer is yeah. correct. Yeah, two, two perforation and um, patient is presenting with the uh, gas under diaphragm and uh, uh, history, LH history of trauma. So might be we can take an ileostomy. Why? How will ileostomy help? We have two perforations. They can be repaired. Principle does not change if the patient is the patient is going to heal. If the score is good, we can close. So although this was this is what but I presented this case, put it up for you to understand that you don't need ileostomy all the time. Sometimes we over by doing an ileostomy. This patient could have been managed by if the perforations are very close to each other, we have a segment which can be resected and we can do an osmosis. But they're 0.5 into 0.5 centimeter and 1.5 into 1.5. So both can be repaired. Problem here was it was close to IC junction, so this is why they were there was a, the, one of the perforation was taken out as ileostomy. To be so defensive in these cases, especially trauma cases with a score which is good, we should be able to go for primary. Well, thank you, you answered well. So we move on to the. You can unmute yourself now. We go to the next cases, which okay. are related to. Now thank you, the, sir. Yao. Patient has developed burst abdomen on day seven. Now listen to this story and uh, the patient developed burst abdomen on post of day seven and had mucocutaneous separation at the stoma site with stomal retraction on post of day twenty and leak from the distal perforation site. To reduce the fecal contamination of the abdominal cavity, temporary approximation of the proximal and distal loop done. And laparostomy was made. You will see the picture on the screen when it comes. You know, case was different from what we imagined. It's not a case from our institution. It's been considered for ward rounds in the scope course also. But I have different questions. This is day 15, and you can see the patient's appearance. Right is the catheter side, and left is the portal side. Right, so yes. that's a picture. Next, what do you think has happened? Uh, in that, due to the trauma, uh, some bowel injuries occurred and is not look like the uh, perforation, but uh, damaging of the vascularity. So they lead a perforation after that time. Sometimes, this so one might the possibility. That's and, one possibility. It can all, it is talking about missed perforation or impending perforation which was missed. That's absolutely correct. What else can happen in a patient who sustained trauma? They can be uh, the uh, viability, viability of the bowel would be doubtful, which can also produce that picture. So the investigations are shown, and yeah. stick to that, and then you don't. Know. So what? Well, there is one possibility. So what is it that we can do? And a second possibility is a platelet count low. So might be patient developed the DIC, DIC and causing embolism and causing the ischemic lead. That's too far. That's too far fetched. Don't think about it. The easier one is more common. Don't think of DIC leading to uh, for DIC will cause bleeding. So there's no history. DIC is condemned so it will be bleeding also from the wound side of the catheter side, etc. That has not happened. And uh, don't go by this picture. This picture is suggestive of sepsis. And you can have, you missed a perforation. And now you have to manage this patient as an open abdomen and hope the best. And you can look at the plastered abdomen. This patient was referred to us. We didn't know it was much to be in this case because we had to, we can't intervene. So we try to do, the, we manage it as a laparostomy. The wound manager, and we can do a tube ileostomy. That is, the tube goes into the perforation, 
that can drain the contents out. So there is, you have to manage this patient as an infected patient now, rather than just looking at the wound. The management would be management of the patient, management of the wound, and then the other things. You would need to be assessed for infection, would need to be assessed for where all are the leaks. The problem with contrast CT in these patients is oral contrast leaks from all over. You don't get a very good picture. The collection would be happening all around. This patient has to be managed by using wound manager and regular washes. And the outcome is dependent on patient's general condition and nutrition. If the patient needs a supplementary nutrition, patient needs uh, not TPN. What's the disadvantage of putting patient on TPN completely? Hello, sir. What is the disadvantage of putting the patient on TPN? It's causing metabolic disturbance in uh, their uh, uh, metabolic mainly the, electrolyte mainly the stress balance and and villus atrophy, stasis of the bowel, which lead to cholestasis and then jaundice, and then you won't be able to give it also. One thing. Secondly, the gut is not used. So I always say this to my residents, guts, use them or lose them. If you lose them, if you don't use them, you lose them. So enteral nutrition is always better. But there are situations where you cannot uh, really hope that you can provide it through the enteral route. But as much as possible should be provided to the enteral route. So we'll put it as SPN, supplemental nutrition. So we'll have these this managed as a wound uh, and we will use, and I'm using cursor to show it, Wound manager would make sure that it will be, uh, I hope you can see it, that this is where the wound manager will collect all the fecal and matter that is coming. And we can also use temporary abdominal closure techniques to make sure that we allow with the topical negative pressure therapy, the wound to heal, the contents to drain outside. So thank you. That's about the burst abdomen part that somebody was asking. Now we move on to such chest cases now. Yes. We'll have some quick videos to see and you can actually, after that we'll take questions. We're going to wind up immediately after. Please pay attention to this case and I'll pick up, anybody can start writing answers. This patient had uh, she's a 60 years lady who presented uh, with complaint with history of bullhorn injury one day back and uh, on examination the patient had uh, tachypnea and tachycardia with the uh, difficulty breathing and um, so maybe so actually with the, we, we just see the video without with the audio I'm speaking there making noise can we just <laughs> a very important case to be discussed. There is a defect here. Ab now I'll show you something. Ab khaso mataji. Ab khaso. <laughs> now it shows up. You understand? You're right. Lamba sans lo. Just watch what I'm doing. I'm trying to see if it affects his, her breathing. It does. It does not. There is no paradoxical breathing. There is a prolapse. There is a herniation of the content. That is her herniation of lung is a known feature. Ab khaso, khaso bata ji. If you just ask her to do wall salva, it will show up beautifully. Karo. That's okay. We can stop. Now, well, if you want to know, this is a bullhorn injury of the right side of the chest, elderly lady. Her respiration looks all right. We put in a chest tube. We, would, we were checking for any bronchopural fistula. There was no gas bubbles. And the uh, patient was by and large managed uh, by observation and chest tube drainage. And this is a classical case of hernia of the lung. It's, it's not, it doesn't need any 
The lung is still breathing. I mean, everything is fine. The chest wall has got damaged. You should not treat it by aggressive surgery in the beginning. Patient can be managed uh, by simple supportive measures. And is there any need to apply any uh, pressure padding on the hernia? The answer is no. Patient can breathe all right. Now, we asked somebody who has raised the hand. Ashish, can you answer that? Good afternoon, sir. Can you hear me, sir? We are coming to you third time. I don't know why we are not able to connect you. But there is some Ashish, problem yes. with the microphone, sir. You are... Okay, now I can hear you very well. Now, you saw the video? Yes, sir. The video was slightly choppy. I could not uh, make out the video properly. Okay, then you volunteered. You raised your hand, so I thought you had seen it. Well, it is a case with a chest wall injury where I was very clearly demonstrating that on wall selva it was appearing there was a defect in the chest wall and it was cough impulse also visible we made a diagnosis of lung hernia hernia of the lung right how should we manage it i will that can you add something to what i spoke or if you didn't hear it you can tell us what you do Uh, you like you said there is no uh, there's no place for aggressive surgery here it is a case of lung hernia uh, we can just support the patient give uh, conservative measures give a good oxygen therapy do give good pain control mainly to make sure that if there are any ribs yes. broken <clears throat> give her a right. transdermal fentanyl patch and uh, look rule out flail chest if any there is no flail because the lung is free the lung is uh, it's just that the wall is gone you get my point so you very rightly answered pain management active chest physiotherapy and by ruling out a bronchopleural fistula which i did by showing you the cuff test there was no bronchopleural fistula the patient may need nothing except this supportive treatment and maybe at a much later date we can do the fixation of the chest wall but not right now and no aggressive surgery is actually indicated now especially when you are putting in a chest tube we put it in the triangle of safety, taking care that we don't puncture the lung, because that is one thing you should not do. And very carefully, we'll put in a chest tube. But you're right, we'll not do any aggressive management. Right? Anything else you want to speak? Sir, what is the definite Anything? management for the hernia per se? Are we going to bridge the defect by using some kind of prosthesis? Excellent answer question. Now, we have to look at the size of the defect. If the size of the defect is more than four centimeters, Four is an arbitrary figure. Can you can you see me and hear me? Yes, sir. I can I can hear you and see you as well. Yeah. So if the defect is more than four centimeters, I'm delighted because you can now see what I'm writing. Now, if the defect is large versus the defect is small, we can just approximate the ribs, and the pleura would take care of itself. But if the defect is large, like in this case, this is large. We may need a prosthesis Can you see it? The prosthesis yes, we create by using using a mesh, usually uh, earlier days, I've used composite mesh. But you can use any biological mesh but importantly we use what is called as cyanoacrylate so we make a sandwich of mesh mesh in between one layer above one layer below of cyanoacrylate it becomes kind of a plate and we suture it to the edges and that's because otherwise it will always remain a flail segment it will never be contributing actively so we need to stabilize the chest wall but not immediately since your question is good so i went that extra distance to explain now the other thing which you can look for is the if the pleura is intact which is which is usually the case if the pleura is intact so if the pleura is intact it just goes off as a hernia and the chest wall is broken the 
that is how I will demonstrate the the half impulse and wall cell wire here. Now in that case, you can just push the pleura in and pad it for the time being. I demonstrated that also that the swelling was reducible and on cuffing it came up, came out. So later for at a later later stage we'll use a prosthesis, which I've also described just now. This will be cyanoacrylate. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So well, very well answered. And actually, we'll do everything that we do for a chest wall management. What is running of the system in in relation to in the chest tube? Can you tell us what exactly do you understand by the running of the system? There is a rib here, rib here, there's a chest tube in place. What do you understand by the term? This will be very commonly used. Running the system. What is that? What do you mean by that? I'm not aware of this term, sir. Yeah. So if you see the column is not moving, we usually attribute it to either the blocking of the tube or the lung is expanded or both. So, or there is a hole in the tube somewhere which you can miss out. So, what do we do in this case? We never, never clamp a tube. That's a wrong thing to do anytime. The only time you should clamp a tube is when the patient is being shipped for <coughs> some investigations or from one room to the other, and then you remember to take it off. The important aspect is not let it be there for a long time. Now, running the system is you apply multiple clamps, you know, one after the other. You walk up, you walk the tube, the leak is, and if the leak can be excluded, or you can find a leak in the tube, then you need to replace it, or you can sometimes seal the leak because that can be the cause. The air leak can happen. So therefore, running the system is term this term used for looking at the possibility of a block in the tube, or a plus possibility of a leak in the tube. Right now, suppose yes, there were gas bubbles coming in this tube. Uh, when I was doing the cuff test, what would you have done differently? If there were gas bubbles, sir. Yeah, in the uh, water bottle, when we ask the patient to cough, there are gas bubbles. It indicates that bronchopleural fistula. Bronchopleural fistula. Yes. What do we do? What do we do in that case? Same patient. We observe the patient uh, expectantly and see if the number of bubbles or the amount volume of air coming out from the ICD reduces over a period of time. More often than not, the, the blongopleural fistulae come down over a period of time and no active intervention is usually necessary. If the patient is deteriorating, if there is some signs of infection or if the blongopleural fistula is increasing, we would need to explore the patient actively and go ahead and do something to the fistula and close it. Any, any investigation before that which you would need to have before you can say what you are saying. You're right. We look at the number of bubbles. We see the patient's condition because we treat the patient, not the tube again. And if the bronchopleural fistula is getting, uh, you know, confined, we need bronchoscopy to actually grade them. Right? You can also do CT of the thorax to know for the size of the fistula. If it's a small one, you can seal it endoscopically also, or from outside. We can use wax to seal it, or sometimes you can use the cross sutures. Uh, if it is a small one and most of the time as you rightly said it stops so i've given you all the options so that these are the questions that will come out of a case like this management of the chest tube is something which is always asked and uh, uh, we we have tackled it most questions are tackled as i've gone along so there will be very few questions at the end maybe we'll have one or two more cases and then we'll wind up so this is what was expected of you, you in the answering and you answered it beautifully Thank you very much, but stay tuned. I'll call you for some other next case also, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You can mute it. Please watch the next video. It's a case of trauma, as you can see. And there was a sign you saw initially on the face. Now we are asking to take a deep breath. What do you observe? Taking it down to the chest tube. Now, volunteers or answers.
Anybody would like to volunteer quickly? The classical case of chest tra polytrauma, where uh, we have a panda sign which is present, which is that you have blackish discoloration around the eyes, uh, which is periorbital uh, collection due to anterior cranial force injury, which was there in this case, and along with a flail chest. Now, I'll pick up Ashish only because he was there fresh. How do you manage this case? Ashish, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Ashish, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. I'm here. Yes, Ashish, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you, sir. Hello. All right. We just... Hello. Hello. The flail chest, uh, when you have fracture of two or more than two ribs, and two or more than two places. So naturally, you have a segment which is flail. And this is the flail segment. The flail segment would make it a paradoxical respiration because the segment is not not a part of the. chest wall anymore and when it is flail we need to manage it by usually management of the patient providing him all the trauma related uh, ATLS protocol which we don't want to discuss here and then IPPV which will serve as an internal pneumatic splint the lung would be the respiration would be controlled by the machine so the chest wall would move as we want it and that would help in making sure that there is no paradoxical respiration and the whole chest moves as one and when that happens the respiration automatically settles the other advantage of IPPV is the control is in the hands of the machine so IPPV is the standard of care there is no evidence to support the early fixation of flail chest and uh, the ribs can be allowed to be as they are and the rest of the management is pain management which was covered in the previous case and uh, overall management of the patient is what is necessary i think we will uh, we'll take more questions now rather than discussing the other cases to discuss but since uh, uh, we are not getting the answer so yes some answers are given on in the form of writing yes very good divang dipyang mansi patel also mansi patel has also answered Expected treatment management advantage of adding gastrostomy with the intention. We'll we'll get into that. So that's the management of this case, where uh, where where you can participate in the discussion beyond this. Now we'll have one more case, which is uh, retrosternal extension of the thyroid gland, uh, which probably we can take. There's another video. Uh, there's a one one more. This one. Yes. Please see this. Uh, we'll, I'll have again one of you participating. I think I'll have Nana. So Nana, unmute yourself. Good afternoon, sir. sir can you hear me? Now, this is a case of the polytrauma. What? Don't bother about the sound. Yes. So this is a case of polytrauma, and you can see the ribs there. The chest wall is all gone. Tell us about the management of this case. Sir, I'll manage the first according to the ATLS Nana, protocol. The vitals... Yes, sir, I, I can hear you. I can't hear you. Now you speak, please. Yeah, so, so uh, first I'll uh, maintain the vitals of the patient according to the ATLS protocol and uh, right. check for airway breathing, circulation, and um, if the patient is vitally stable. And as it is, it is a penetrating injury to the chest. Yes. So is the patient vitally stable? It is. It is actually. Uh, yes, you can carry on. Now you can see the chest wall is all gone. Yes, sir. Now what can you do beyond the routine protocol that you already discussed? So we will not get into that part. Would you like to fix the chest wall in this case? No, sir, so, um, uh, not as of now. As the patient is already widely stable. 
I'd like to put him in oxygen and uh, clean the wound and avoid uh, any infection of the wound and dress it up. Okay. You see the video, I mean, you must have seen in the video that there is some movement which is abnormal here. So, uh, contrary to what you saw in the previous case, the, this is an open wound, isn't it? Yes, sir. There is a wound here. You need sir, to do something can, here. Sir, I can uh, wrap it. Uh, so, I can put in a chest tube and uh, close it from three sides. And uh, now, this could be contaminated, so we may not fix it immediately. But what do you do when you have? Uh, the compound fractures in the long bones. We do external fixation, don't we? Yes, sir. And we keep the wound dressing. So there is a possibility of doing that in these cases, and which is what we did here. The they were fixed using the steel wires, but the wound was left open. So this stabilized it. So somewhere you can stabilize it. It's not always a steel wire that you need. You can also use simple number of protein through periosteum and just keep them together. The other thing is you can also stabilize by using an external support, which you probably were referring to. Once you've got the external support in place, the wound can be managed because the wound is there. That's a, that was the difference here, unlike in the previous case. So the Sorry. open wound managed with good antibiotic cover, regular dressings, and of course, you need to support the skeleton because of the wound keep the movements keep on happening, then the healing will not. Happen. Sir, and the this chest tube will, be, will be put through an another way, right? Definitely, and that's what I was going to ask you. Glad you asked. Where do you normally put a chest tube all the time? So we put it. Usually, we put it through the same wound and uh, close it up with three sides. No, but in this, no, 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 no. Chest tube is always put in the triangle of safety. We triangle don't bother about. Okay, and that is bounded entirely by the. And the axillary fold, posteriorly by the posterior axillary fold and the fifth rib below. So there yes, is no sir. confusion about chest tube would be put. And we, in any case, never put a tube through the wound that we are trying to dress. No drains are put through any wound. So we will not use the chest tube through the wound. Okay? Yes. This wound okay. will be just, uh, ribs will be just put together so that we have a supported, uh, we have a support to the wound. And then we'll manage it by regular dressings, antibiotic cover, and Go for the best. When the wound is granulating, we can cover it up with a, we can mobilize the skin from around or we can put a graft or a flap. That is what we will be doing in this. Yes, sir. Do you have a question? No, sir. Thank you. You answered it. And we are winding up the, there is one more case. If, if you are keen, we can take it. And if you all are keen, then I can get a yes in the, I mean, otherwise, we'll move to the question answers. If there are any questions, we'll take. So, uh, uh, the, the one question by Dr. Harshwardhan is, why no mesh in irreducible hernia? Okay. Uh, you can give me the screen to write on. Harsh, uh, I don't think you attended earlier lectures of mine or you've been part of the board rounds in the past. Remember, I said the first thing, any patient with irreducible hernia has to, I need to write on. Any, uh, any patient with uh, an irreducible hernia needs to be treated as potentially obstructed and strangulated. I hope that is clear. And we'll take your questions, don't worry now. We'll take more questions now, that will be better. Irreducible hernia has to be uh, Anyway, irreducible hernia has to be taken as triangulated or obstructed or whatever. That's why we are doing surgery in emergency. When we are doing surgery in emergency, where are we operating? We can we are operating in the emergency OT. What is happening in the emergency OT? Lots of emergency cases. So it's not a clean OT. It's not a clean surgeon. It's not a clean team. No mesh. 
no prosthesis if the OT is contaminated. So the answer is any patient with strangulated hernia, no mesh. And any patient who's taken up in emergency, no mesh. This is the recommendation that protocol that I'm trying to teach you. There are situations where you can get away by using mesh. The infection may not happen. But as a rule, the standard is the standard is no mesh because it's a contaminated environment, feed and a surgeon. Next question. What is the difference in surgery between when we are dealing with a sliding, sliding hernia? Well, that's a good question, so I'll take it. When we're dealing with a slide, you should know what is a slide. Slide is when one wall of the hernia is formed by a viscous. Simple, no confusion. So if I was to draw it, I can only draw a cross section, one wall, not all walls. So one wall is, okay, I'll take blue color. This is the wall. This is a viscous. Now the earlier treatment for this used to be, you make a cut here, we open it, we make a cut here, and what do we do? We push the contents in, and we close the two ends. So we extra peritonalize the contents. This was called reperitonalizing the sac. This procedure is no longer done. It's very cumbersome. We have done it. It used to be done. It's mentioned in the book. The management is reduce the sac along with the slide. Because that doesn't change the outcome. The management is of the, I mean, you're going to provide a Repair to the posterior wall. So this is not length of hernia doesn't make a hernia re recurrence. High dissection rather than high ligation. So I'll dissect it as high as possible and push the whole thing down along with the slide, and then do the posterior wall repair. So that's a management of slide. What is running of the chest tube? I'll repair. Repair it. Yes, sir. Please the chest tube is the, in the, drain. the problem with. Not in the drain. The question, the, the statement was, we never clamp a chest tube. Please understand it properly. Now, we never clamp a chest tube because it can lead to spontaneous or otherwise a pneumothorax and can kill a patient. And sometimes you've seen when there's gush of blood, people just don't want to see it, so they clamp the tube. That is not a good thing to do. You should let it drain. And running the system means you're just looking for the possible leak somewhere. So what do I do? I clamp here with my fingers or some instrument. Clamp here. See that there's no leak. Leak, 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 leak. Or you can do a water leak test. That was called running the system. And we don't clamp it because it can precipitate uh, um, the respiratory arrest in these patients or can produce picture-like spontaneous pneumothorax. Which is therefore not tension pneumothorax. I'm using the word constantly. Can produce tension in right? so we don't do that. Or hemotherapy, depending on what you have. Next question. Sir, Dr. Shiva, what exactly was meant by Witzel Jejnostomy? Well, I think I've described it. I'll go into that later. We'll take those questions which are more, which are new. Most people are asking for more cases, but the question then will go. The volunteers are there. There's so many volunteers. No, sir, we took them. What oh, shall we do? So what do we do when hernia reduced on OT table after spinal? That's a very Dr. good Simon. question. Just stay there. Uh, you can now see the board also. Who has asked that question? Dr. Suman. So Suman, that's a good question. If it reduces under spinal, is it there? Yes. Proceed with surgery as before but the question can be extrapolated 
it reduces on its own in the ward in the ward this patient needs to be observed for 24 hours for what same thing that i was discussing reduction in mass because it may manifest in 24 hours so that's the answer to your question can we go to the next one yes sir the next question is uh by dr shiva kamesh uh, says so sac is open at the fundus or the neck, often asked by our seniors. Never understood. Always. Is always wrong. That's one thing you should remember. But it is open mostly at fundus. And it does matter. You should not open at the neck. Because if you open the neck, the contents will go in. And there will be a disaster. Now that's a sack. I hope that is clear. And these are the contents. Now I hope you know that is the neck. Which is usually at the deep ring. We open where? Here. Drain out the contents. Check for the loops, and never at the neck. Perhaps having said that, it is not fundus always because you can open somewhere here. But fundus is the ideal site to open it. I hope that is clear. And the contents will be inspected for before they are allowed. This is the last part to be opened at the neck because if it slips back, then you left you allowed the, the strangulated bowel to go in, which is which is not. The right thing to do. Next question, please. The next question is by Dr. Um, so somebody was asking to uh, kindly explain the incarcerated hernia again, Dr. Aditya. See, if I have a hernia which is irreducible, not obstructed. And there is some fecal matter here which may once in a while block it and it will get released. So incarceration basically means it's a term very commonly used in infants. So it's not a commonly used term, so don't use it. It may get obstructed, and incarceration is mostly indicative of imprisonment. And a prisoner is usually alive. We don't have a dead prisoner. Prisoner would be alive and in a cage. So it's a living bowel. You can manage it by, like I said, anytime it is irreducible, you can do a planned surgery. Unless the patient is coming with acute symptoms like the case. And incarceration is not synonymous with strangulation. Please understand that. Because strangulation would mean the prisoner is dead, <coughs> which is not the case in the prison. Incarceration means in prison. So, how will we manage pantaloon hernia by Dr. Adnan Khan? I'll manage it, manage it as any hernia. This is the pantaloon hernia. That's in fibrogastric vessels. Please watch some of our models that we have put a lot of effort went in. By seeing that we prepared models for hernia, you should watch it. This is the epigastric vessels, and obviously somewhere here is the also the deep ring. So the hernia is too large. What the, what it decides is to go. Way. part of it and this way so the same hernia i'm sorry so it's the same hernia it has gone this way and it's gone this way it's a hernia only what I would do is I lift up the deep ring, 
get the vessels, ligate it, cut it, and then it becomes one hernia, treat it like any other. What is holding it like a pantalon is the inferior epigastric vessel. So it is a hernia lateral to it as well as medial to it, which is what this is the triangle of Hesselbach. One part is coming out of here, the other part is coming out of here, like a pantaloon. So you will repair the posterior wall like we do. We can use the lichen still mesh hernia plastic is the triangle of Hesselbach. So part of it is coming here and part of it is coming here, but the hernia is one of mine. Okay, so we have a part here, we have a part here, and it's being blocked by this. So we get these vessels off, it becomes one. Usually I'll do a shoulder ice in these cases. Sir, Dr. Yusuf Jain was asking role of pyloric exclusion and gastrogenostomy in giant hormones. I think I took that, yes, sir. but I'll show the, the drawing, the, the picture was not working that time, so I'll just show it again. Yes, the this was the giant neural perforation. What do we do here? You make a small opening in the stomach. And through that, we put a purse string using vicryl sutures. Some people use proline. That closes the pylorus, the purse string inside. And we use the same opening for gastrogen. That's pyloric exclusion and teaching. So this is the exclusion, and this is the GJ. This naturally involves an anastomosis. If the patient's general condition is not very good, we don't find it doing very well. So what we would now concern is this anastomosis, which if it heals well, and usually will adding feeding J along with it anyway, the plan B, and if it is, and this can be, then you can do whatever, patching. I would put in a polys inside, inflating it, and hitching this to the parietes, which will make it a parietal patch of the peritoneum. And then this bile that comes out, I can feed it in. So let me did not speak plus. I'll create an extra corporeal shunt, which will feed back the bile. And over a period of time, this would be Moved. I'm not talking about PEGJ. PEGJ is already described. Next. Sir, so Dr. Navya has answered about the phantom hernia. It was the bulge of muscle tone, or muscle due to paralysis of the muscle. Excellent answer. With the weakness of the muscle, something on the lines of malgagny bulges, you can get the phantom hernias. And uh, this is just by the way. Who has answered? Dr. Navya. Napier, what is she's complete answer? Read out loudly. So she has written phantom uh, hernia is bulging of the muscle due to paralysis of the muscle. Bulge of the muscle due to paralysis. Not of paralysis, muscle. weakness. That's why I won't do it. But that's well answered. Next. The next. Um, we have another five minutes to go, so we'll finish off with the last question. We tried to wanted to cover up some more cases. We'll take them next time. The management of spigelian hernia by Dr. Asit. Well, it's spigelian hernia is where the the inferior epigastric vessel is entering into the rectus sheath. So there is a hernia which is to be managed by you can do it laparoscopically or you can usually there is an absent posterior rectus sheath in the lower one third of the I mean the junction between the you draw a line between symphysis pubis and and the umbilicus the vessels enter here. There's no posterior rectus sheath here. So this is the weak point which hernias can happen. <clears throat> Managed like any other hernia is reduced and we repair the, the rectus sheath as we normally do. Any other question? Sir, uh, Dr. Suman is asking that in the uh, lateral uh, dornostomy, tubus uh, coming out through the same portal. Yes, patient. because it's too large to be closed. And even if you close it, it'll open up. So this is kind of a bailout procedure. Good question, Suman. What it does is, you know, this is an opening. How do I close it? No suture will work here. So what we do is we put in a hole is to inflate and inflate to a level that it gets kind of, uh, you know, cozily 
sutured, and then you put a couple of sutures only. But we don't take duodenum to the wall. We bring the wall to the duodenum, so it gets covered. Some people also like to do one more thing in addition, which is very good. That is, they put a tea tube into the common bile duct. But you can understand this dissection would be a challenge. So that takes all the bile out. So then you can do whatever procedure. Because most other procedures usually fail here. So it's through the same perforation. You're right. Sir, Dr. Siva Kamesh is asking if you could uh, kindly elaborate on placing a drain retroperitoneally via McBurney incision. That's another good question, relevant. What do we do? We have made an incision, which I have taught people to make it a little lateral to the lateral to the McBurney's okay. point. I think go a little lateral because in any case, I don't want to hit and this is my classical approach. McBurney's point incision, you hit the small bubble loops, they'll all be popping out and they'll bother you. So what do I do? Instead, I make a little lateral incision, which will make me go to the cecum, which is what I want to do. Mine, mine's in only just about two centimeters medial to the antispelic spine, which is this here. And I'll keep going through the uh, skin, then the external oblique, then I'll cut through the transverse abdominis. I will not split these muscle fibers because I don't want a rat door or rat trap drainage. And then I go behind without opening the peritoneum. Behind, I'll go with my finger. And I'll puncture the abscess, drain it, drain as much as I can and leave the drain there. But I bring it out through another opening. And this can be loosely sutured, not the muscles. We can even leave it open. So Dr. Swatej is asking if hernia turns out to be strangulated, whether to do dis uh, resection osmosis from inguinal incision or whether to do lepotomy. That's a very good question. Who's asked? So Dr. Swatej Singh. See, the, the, uh, the answer is, if you can do it, then two inguinal incision but it is difficult mostly because the gut is edematous and you've resected and if it slips back in you're in trouble so it is advisable that you go through the midline low midline and do a proper anastomosis but you after you've resected so resection i'm repeating two inguinal incision only anastomosis to a midline laparotomy idea but rarely, if the part is very small, if you can do it through the inguinal incision, absolutely no problem. But it's not usually, you know, it's possible but not probable, as I say. Possible but not probable. This becomes an option. But resect before you go into the abdomen. So what would be the ideal fluid for resuscitation in gastric outlet obstruction by Dr. Harshwarthy? You answered yourself. Now, we've lost lots of uh, chlorides. Patient is already in alkalosis. Naturally, it will depend on what is the status of the uh, patient in terms of acidosis and alkalosis. So, fluid is to correct it. So, you'll be giving acidotic fluid. Having said that, don't take Ringer's lactate as acidic, it is alkaline because. Ringer's lactate changes into soda bicarb kind of a thing or an alkaline thing in the liver. It's an alkaline solution. So patient is already in alkalosis. He lost lots of acid. He'll replace it with sodium chloride initially. And it's not a very difficult acidosis to correct. So don't get too much dragged into it. End of the day, some people would say DNS, because you'll have to give some dextrose, but I would say isotonic, that is normal saline, to replace the, to take care of the alkalosis. But there are other aspects to look into it, which is a long discussion, where you need to take into account the electrolytes also. And usually, under stress, we don't give sodium for too long, because sodium is retained in stress. So patient has got sodium, and along with that, chloride would be there. So we don't give too much of sodium in the immediate post-operative period or patient under stress, because sodium is being retained due to secretion of aldosterone or steroids during stress. So taking that into consideration, but we will be able to uh, uh, make it a point to make, I mean, correct the alkalosis. So uh, next doctor, uh, Kush Parikh is asking that if a truncal vigotomy with uh, GJ versus Bilrot 2 for the chronic duodenal ulcer in scarring. 
I think that part was covered. Yeah. So still there? No, no, wait a minute. Wait. I have a doubt. Can you go back, please? Yeah. Read it. I think that I've answered. So basically, the GJ, if there is scarring here or no scarring here, that's one option because this is obstructed anyway. So we are bypassing obstruction and because we are doing gastrogenostomy, we are taking care of trunkal record. These are the two things which you need to look at. If you are not happy with pyloroplasty, the other option is you can do pyloroplasty, get the scar tissue removed and close it transversely. Naturally, this is more cumbersome, easier to do, more likely to fail also here. And we need to have a good drainage in these cases. And GJ is a fairly simple and very quickly done procedure, along with trunk truncal vigotomy, which we have covered. So this you had answered in the previous webinar. How to avoid post-operative additions in peritonitis cases. I think we discussed it last time. That is, I'll repeat it, meticulous tissue handling is something you should remember. Not too much of lavage with hot water. And using less of diathermy. There was a case about it, which we'll take later on. You don't have time. Less of use of diathermy because you'll produce ischemic spots and you may burn it. And some people say the dust in the glove, which is a powder that you use, has also been found to be responsible. To never let it drop in the peritoneal wound. And then the best option is prevent it. A lot of people have used Dextran 70 and other agents to reduce it. But I think a tissue handling, less use of diathermy, not tying too much tissue, not burning too much tissue, all this can prevent adhesions. In spite of that, adhesions may develop. And we should not uh, produce ischemic spots, which is the major cause of formation of adhesions. So Dr. Anandi is asking for post of by leak and MRCP be an investigation? I think there was a by leak case. We'll cover it up in the next uh, webinar. But MRCP is not the best investigation uh, because it will show you nothing. You basically need, a lot of people feel that CT is a better investigation for the collection. But ultrasound will guide you. MRCP can just let you know in a later stage whether there is a site of leak from where the anatomy could be abnormal or not. But ERCP has a therapeutic role in addition to diagnostic. So ERCP is what a lot of people prefer to do. I'm not saying MRCP has no role. What I'm trying to say is, relatively speaking, CT is very good for collections, and MRCP for the biliary tree, and ERCP for the therapy. Damage control surgery, Asit Chakravarti. Uh, well, you answered the question very well, but probably you could not be audible. So. I appreciate that answer. And I think that takes care yes, of most sir. of the questions. Yes, sir. Sir, Dr. Harshwadhan, chest tube was put for hemothorax after day five. The output is of sanguinous, 30 ml for past two days. Patient is asymptomatic, vitally stable, but x ray is showing CP angle blunting and mild effusion. Can we remove the chest tube or any role of pulling out of the tube and refixing it? Well, that's a very, very important question, very commonly asked. Now, the, the most important thing is how is the patient hemodynamically, clinically, and how is the chest? Sometimes the blunting can stay for longer time than you want. Right? So if the patient is respiratory, why respiration, the air entry is good, everything is fine. Now, there is a case for pulling the chest tube, but then that was a case when the chest tube was directed in one direct way. Nowadays, we know the action is capillary, and it's got nothing to do with where you put it. Do you put it in the same triangle of safety all the time? both hemothorax and pneumothorax. If the patient's general condition is good, and if the content and the amount, as you're saying, is less, and if it is serious sanguine it's drying up, I'll remove the chest tube, but I'll get a chest X-ray done before that, and chest X-ray done after that. And we can keep the patient for a day under observation. So Dr. Kritika is asking if we can wait for, uh, uh, if the patient is asymptomatic and irreducible hernia, can we wait and post as elective case? Well, uh, that's another good question. It can be if the elective surgery happens the next morning. We can't delay it for too long. My answer to the question was, it's an emergency surgery. Where you do it is not what I said. If, if, you're, the, if you're operating on 
some VVIPs, and you have a patient with irreducible hernia, you will get a main OT open on that day. You can put a mesh. But my reasons for not putting a mesh were that if there is an element of infection, you just had it and can't mess with mesh. It can be a horrible infection. But you can wait and for the, for the elective OT in an irreducible but asymptomatic patient. If the patient is symptomatic, you take it as obstructive. My, my problem is I cannot say for sure 100% that this irreducible hernia, which has happened is an acute phenomenon in last six to eight hours, is not obstructed or spinal. I cannot say by good clinical examination. So I'll know it on tape. They are investigation, but they are not very, very sensitive. But if you think it's just an irreducible hernia, which has been there for four or five days, patient is comfortable, we can do it in the next OT that we can get in the elective scenario. And then you can manage it as an elective hernia. Many a time, people have irreducible hernias and they carry, there's a loss of domain. People have a scrotal abdomen also, they continue to live with it. So it depends. If the patient is symptomatic acutely, you have to treat it acutely. Dr. Harshwadhan is asking if in a burst abdomen with uh, intracutaneous fistula and surrounding skin inflamed and patient is not affordable for the costly stoma bag because the size is required is bigger and the skin is slippery due to inflammation and any uh, um, any idea how to manage the situation and low cost management options to protect the surrounding skin. From I'm the surprised you did not uh, watch the last webinar or you don't remember what you watched. I had shown you the use of super glue which is nothing but very quick. It's FDA approved which works very well in the peri wound area, use that and it will be helping you in the sticking of the the, the Euro bag zipper leprostin, which again I showed you last time. I think this I had addressed last time. I find this egg white business nonsense because it stinks and it doesn't help. And all the other creams are fancy and expensive as you rightly said. We use very quick and please read my article on super glue in uh, leprostomy or stoma. You can find it on PubMed and also on Zipper Leprosomy, you'll find an answer, but you can use it. So, most of them. Yeah, so I will just elaborate on this further. Now, peri stoma or peri burst abdomen, we apply the, the super glue, which is very quick. The only precaution we need to take. I have a request. Please don't forget what you were taught last time because it's a lot of effort that goes into it. You should always revisit the webinar it's for your reason and your interest that we do it and it is not that uh, there is any other interest involved here so it's for you to go through the previous lectures and webinars to appear like a good student who should be asking more questions there's no problem in the question we apply super glue which sticks to the skin and we don't have to remove it the only care you need to take is wear glasses because the vapors can be harmful to the eyes apply it and Leave it there. In seven days, when stratum corneum comes up, it gets peeled off on its own. You don't need to peel off. And it forms an impervious layer over which the contents can fall. It's a pity if somebody is thinking that we'll just post it on the YouTube and you will be watching this webinar then. I think it's a waste of an effort. Uh, don't be lazy about things. You should attend it live, whatever it takes. So. And it is going to be benefiting you only because I covered up most of the parts relating to abdomen and thorax today. We'll take up the other parts maybe next week. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed getting it to you. Now, if you could just post yes there, we'll know that you saw it. And at the same time, it was our pleasure to bring it. And we did it because a lot of you were asking for the war round cases and we ex made them extra extrapolate into the theoretical discussion also. So, if there are no more questions, we already run. Right then, thank you very much. And uh, uh, all the very best to you. We hope to see you next week. And I think the concluding part, I'll leave it to Sukriti to tell you as to how you can. We will not, we'll not upload it immediately because that's one thing which will make you lazy and you would not be watching, which you should. So, I'm glad I'm getting all those responses. Thank you very much and uh, uh, have a great day. Enjoy your day. It's a Sunday for us too, mind you. We kept it for you. So hopefully you find it useful. But do go through the webinars regularly when it actually is happening so that you are actively involved in it rather than keeping it uh, pending till 
it appears on the YouTube. That is a sign of a very lazy professional, and he's not going to benefit much out of it. Thank you. Thank you, thank so, you much, so much, sir. For putting no, it sir, together. sir uh, thank you so much for the valuable time, and also because there were the internet connection was not uh, fine. You okay. use the board also, and uh, thank you so much, sir, for teaching us. Pleasure, and uh, thank you for watching. Hopefully, we'll catch up with you next week. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir.